Module 1, Functions in Organization. Topic 1.1, Why Use Functions? So we're going to talk a little bit about functions right now. We've been using functions since the start because you basically have to. You can't write code, at least in Golang, without a function. So we've been using functions already uh, in passing, but now I'll focus a little bit more on how they're used, uh, how you define them, how you use them, and be a little bit more specific about the meaning of a function. So what is a function? A function is really just a set of instructions with a name. And, and the name is actually optional, as we'll see later in a few more lectures. We'll, uh, we'll see that you don't actually need the name, but it's a, a bunch of instructions that are grouped together, okay? and usually with a name, or certainly for now, with a name. So we can see first, uh, we got this first function over here, main, right? Funk main. We're defining a function, and that's its name, main. And we've all of our programs so far, they all have a main. In fact, all programs in Go have to have a main function, right? That's where execution starts. We already said that, but I'll just remind you again. So there's always at least this function main. Now, if you look at the way, um, the way we define that function, it says func main, open paren, close paren, and then there's a curly bracket, right? So, uh, and then between the curly bracket, so there's open curly bracket, then there's bottom curl, lower curly, uh, close curly bracket. Between that is the, con is the contents of the function. So those instructions in there are the instructions that are part of the function. Now this main on top, it's a very simple main. All it has is one line of code, uh, format printf, hello world. But you could put any number of lines of code in there and it would be, they would be all grouped together in this function called main. So this is really the simplest uh, way you could define a function at all. Now, uh, a function, now the main function is actually a special function in the sense that you never call this function. So when you run your program from the command line, say, when you run the program, the main function gets called and invoked immediately. So calling a function means to execute that function. And uh, that happens automatically with main. As soon as you run it, it goes straight to main, calls that function. But for any other function that you define, you have to call that, that code explicitly. You have to call the function explicitly. So take a look at the example on the bottom. We got two functions here. The, the top one is called print hello, and the bottom one's called main. So uh, let's look at the main for a second. The main, if you look at main, all it has is one line. It calls print hello. So it says print hello, open print, close print. That is a function call. So that's where we call uh, print hello, and at that point in execution, it'll go to print hello and execute whatever print hello, uh, whatever instructions print hello contains. Now, if you look above at print hello, you can see uh, that it's just one instruction, just hello world, right? Just print hello world. So the two programs that we have, the top main and then the bottom program with the, with the uh, main and then the print hello, they do the same thing. Right? It's just that the bottom function, actually, the bottom uh, program has a function call in it, an explicit function call inside main. It calls print hello. So this is really, what you're seeing here is really the simplest kind of function you can ever have. Uh, so a function declaration is where you define the function. So a function declaration in Golang starts with that keyword func, F-U-N-C. And then, it, then you have the, uh, the name of the function after that in the line. You have open paren, close paren. You might have arguments in there. We'll talk about that soon. And uh, you can also have return values. We'll talk about that too. And then there's curly brackets. Inside the curly brackets are the contents of the function. And functions can also be called. In fact, they have to be called except for the main, which doesn't get called. It just gets executed automatically. So why use a function? <clears throat> there, are, uh, there are a lot of reasons. One reason right off the top is reusability. So what that means is uh, you, you don't have to rewrite the same code over and over again. So if you have a function, you define a function, you only need to define that function or declare that function one time. And then you can call it and run it as many times as you want. So maybe you write this function once, and then you need to invoke it 100 times. Maybe you need to do this operation 100 different times. So then you can write it once, but you only write it once. Then you call it 100 times, and it saves you, uh, it basically shrinks the size of your source code. Okay, so and you can reuse it. You can actually reuse it across, pro across projects too. So people can, um, can use your function. They can import the library and use your function in their code too. So it's good for reuse. It, good for commonly used op operations in this way, right? So things that you do a lot, you might want to make them a function and give them a name so that you don't have to keep rewriting that code over and over. You can just call the code. So as a few examples of functions you might make. Uh, say you're writing some kind of graphics ed editing program. You might have a function called threshold image. So uh, 
not to go too much into graphic editing, but there are a lot of uh, a lot of operations in graphics. So you got an image. It is often it's common to threshold an image. So basically, if the brightness is above a threshold, then it, you make it black. If it's below a threshold, you make it white. Okay, common operation. Uh, you do it a lot. So you might write a function just for that purpose, and then you can call it a hundred times. Whenever in your code you need to do it, you call it. Uh, say you got a database program. You might have a query dbase function, right? Uh, querying a database is probably the main thing you do with a database, right? You got a database, you want to get some data out of it, you query the database. So that type of thing, you might want to write it as a function because you know you're going to do it over and over again, and then you just call the function. Also, another little example, say you got some music program or a music editing program. Uh, change key, this is a function I thought of. There are many functions you can do with music, but change a key, maybe you want to change the key from A to C, so maybe you have a function for that purpose, right? Because you do it a lot. These function titles uh, is that they're they're specific to the application. So in graphics, your function might threshold an image, which is specific to graphics. Database program, you might query a database specific to that domain. Also, changing key is specific to music. So this is something you're going to have to think about when you make bigger pieces of code. And we'll talk more about this in the uh, later in the module. But uh, when you're organizing your code. Uh, your code will usually have lots of functions, and they'll be organized in some sort of a, a calling hierarchy. And you'll have to think about how you want to, what you want to put together in a function, and what you don't. So another reason, another very important reason to use functions is for the purpose of ab abstraction. So abstraction, uh, abstraction is the designer's friend, and not just in computer science, but just all over the place. Any kind of design, certainly for engineers, but I don't even think it's limited to engineering. Uh, abstraction is just hiding details that are less important. I don't want to say unimportant because details count, but uh, hiding details that are less important so you don't have to focus on them all the time. Because generally the problem with big designs is that there's so many details that a human can't keep all these details in his or her mind. So you got to do something to simplify it. You got to work with a lot with complicated code, but it's got to be simple or else your mind just can't hold it. So abstraction is the way you do that. Abstraction is you group things and you hide the details. And functions are exactly for this. So with a function, you have some complicated behavior maybe written in the function. And then you give that function a name. And once you've written that function and you've debugged it, you know it works, you don't have to worry about all the details of what goes on inside that function. All you need to do is call the function. So as long as you understand the input-output behavior, so you understand uh, that a particular function does a particular, if it gets these inputs, it produces these outputs, you know, then you don't have to worry about how. So for instance, sorting, right? Say I want to make a sort function, I'll sort some slice or something like that. I, I'm, I don't care how I sort it. There are many algorithms for sorting, right? I could do a bubble sort, I could do insertion sort, I could do all kinds of sorts. Who cares, right? <laughs> I could just say, oh, there are reasons why you would care. But, but generally, you don't care, you just want it sorted. So you just call this sort function, and you don't have to think about exactly what it's doing inside there to do the sort. You just know, given a slice, the result is a sorted slice. So, uh, so, this, so functions allow you to use abstraction. They're a, a way to implement abstraction. Uh, and it, it improves understandability of the code. So, uh, so for instance, here we've got this example. I got some function called find pupil. I bring this up because I'm actually working on a function that does something like this. It basically looks at an eye, a close-up picture of an eye, and it has to find the pupil, find the center of the pupil. So this function find pupil actually is quite complicated. But uh, I, you know, I to hold to understand every single step at one one. It, so say I showed you the full-on code. It is very nasty looking, okay? It would take you a while to figure out what the heck was going on. But if I write it in the way that I have here, where I've grouped things into a set of functions with nice names, right? Grab image, filter image, uh, find ellipses, right? Each one of those functions, you have an idea what that does. So at a glance, you can look at this function and get some understanding of how it works. Now, of course, you won't get a full understanding just at a glance, but you can you get some part of an understanding right there, right? So this helps understandability, and understandability is, is key uh, in design. Now, uh, also, I should note that the naming is important for this, for this understandability, right? You need a good name, grab image, filter image, find ellipses. The name has to be good. If I just call those X, Y, and Z, you would have no idea what those were. But if they have good names and you group things appropriately, it's easier to understand the code uh, when you need to. Thank you. Module 1, Functions and Organization. Topic 1.2, Function Parameters and Return Values. So uh, the examples that we showed, the function examples that we showed before, were really simple. But generally, uh, 
functions often need some sort of input data to operate on, right? So functions are sequences of instructions or sets of instructions, but they need some data to, to work on. So it is very common for a function to have a set of what are called parameters, which are a set of variables that are listed uh, right after the function name in the declaration in the parentheses. And these are variables that uh, they'll become local variables that are used as inputs to the function. So the function actually operates on these variables internally. Now, an argument is the data that's applied to, to, for those parameters during the call. So uh, to give you an example, we got this function up here called foo. And in parentheses, after the word foo, after the name, you see uh, x int comma y int. So in parentheses is a list of the parameters. So that means there are two parameters, x and y, and they're both integers. So it expects somebody, when, it, when the function gets called, it expects the caller to pass two integers as arguments. And what it'll do is just print the product, right? Print x times y. Now then, if we look in the main, uh, the main actually calls foo. And it calls foo, and in parentheses, it says 2 comma 3. has 2 comma 3. So 2 is going to be passed as x. Y, 3 is going to be bound to y inside the function foo when it executes. So when foo executes, it, 2 will be x, 3 will be y, and it'll print 2 times 3. It should print out 6 uh, when you run a program like this. So having parameters is a very common thing for a function because functions often uh, need some kind of input data to operate on. So there are different ways you can pass parameters. Uh, just to give a couple examples, maybe you don't need parameters. Sometimes a function does not need parameters. Maybe it just does something static and doesn't need input, or it gets input from some other place, right? Maybe it gets input from uh, the user typing it in directly, or maybe it gets it from a file, something like that. So sometimes you don't need arguments. Uh, so, uh, so if that's the case, then you still have to put the, per the open paren, close paren in the declaration after the name. So func foo, open paren, close paren, you still need that there. You just don't put anything in the parentheses, and that no then the, the compiler knows that there are no parameters. Uh, also, uh, another sort of shorthand is when you have multiple arguments of the same type, you can list them, you can comma separate them. You don't have to write int, int, int over and over, say. So in the case uh, below where you got foo, it has two arguments x and y, and they're both ints. You could write x int comma y int, or just write x comma y int. Uh, it's just another way to write it. Now, in addition to having parameters, which are inputs to the function, a function can have an output, one or more outputs, uh, return values. So uh, each return value has to have a type. Okay, So the type of the return value has to be listed in the function declaration on the top right after the uh, the arguments, after the parameters are listed. So uh, you know maybe you know you return an integer, or you know you return a float, or something like that. Uh, and the function call, once you define a function that has a return value, then that uh, the call to that function can be used on the right-hand side of, of a signal assignment, or a signal assignment, a variable assignment, sorry. So just to give an example, it's easier if I just show you. So to give you an example, we got this function foo. It takes an argument x, so you see x int in parentheses after the name foo. Then uh, after that, you see the word int. Right Before the open, cur open curly brackets and closed curly brackets, you see int. That means that the return value, its type is going to be an integer. And then inside the function, uh, inside the curly brackets, you see it says return x plus 1. So if this function has a return value, like it does in this case, then you have to call return in the function at the end of the function. And whatever is after the word return is what's going to get returned. So x, whatever the value of x is, plus 1, that's what's going to get returned by this function. So this function just uh, returns an incremented version of the variable. Now then, uh, down below, uh, you see that, uh, that assignment, y e colon equal foo 1. Now this is taken out of context. That y colon equal foo 1 would have to be in a function of its own. So maybe, let's assume that that statement is inside a main, right? I didn't want to draw the whole main, but let's assume it's in a main. So that's a function call. It's calling the foo function. It's passing as the argument the number 1. So 1 is going to get bound to x inside the function foo when it gets executed. So the function foo that called the foo will return uh, x plus 1. So it will return 2. So that foo, open paren, 1, close paren, that will be replaced in that, that assignment statement with the value 2. So it'll get evaluated. It will be replaced with a 2. And then y will be assigned to the number 2, to the integer 2. So uh, in this way, th this is what happens whenever you have a return value. You've got to do an assignment, right? Y colon equals foo 1. If I didn't, say I just called foo 1, right? Then I, it would execute the function, 
but the return value would would go nowhere, right? I have to have a signal assignment, a variable assignment, so that so the the return value or values get captured. The last example I showed the function took one or had one return value, but you can have multiple return values. So in this example, foo two, we've got two return values. So if we look at the uh, at the declaration, func foo two, x int, that's in parentheses, so that's the argument. Then after that, you have parentheses again, another set of parentheses, int comma int, and that means that you have two return values, and uh, they're both integers. And then after that, you have the code. The code just return uh, x comma x plus one. So those two return values, well, the first one will be x, the second one will be x plus one. So they're listed after return, they're comma separated. And then when I, uh, when, when say in a function main or something like that, when I call foo two, see that a comma b uh, colon equal foo two three, right? So what'll happen is that a comma b, uh, a comma a and b will be assigned to the two return values of foo two. So foo, so a is going to be assigned, assigned like in this case, uh, foo two is going to return x and x comma x plus one. So that'll be three and four. So a would be bound to three, b would be bound to four. Thank you. Module one: Functions and Organization. Topic one point three: Call by value and reference. So. Call by value describes how arguments are passed to parameters during a function call. So in a function call, when you call a function, you get to pass it a set of arguments that are bound to the parameters inside the function when you execute the function. But uh, different languages can pass arguments in different ways. Call by value is how it's done in Go. So what that what call by value means is that the uh, the arguments that are passed as parameters they are copied to the parameters. So the, the data that the function is using uh, from, you know, when it's using the data that's assigned to the parameters, right? With the data that it uses is a copy of the original. It's not the original. So uh, that matters because that means that the function that's being called can't interfere with the original uh, variables in the calling function. So it's possible. So modifying parameters has no effect on the outside function, on the calling function. So easier if we show an example. So say we got this function foo. This function foo it takes uh, one argument uh, y. Why? Why is this parameter? It's an integer, and it just it says y equals y plus one. So all it does is take y, add one to it. Now this is admittedly a dumb procedure because it's going to have no effect. But let's just imagine for argument's sake that this is the function that we want to write. So it takes y, adds one to it. Now main, what it does is it uh, has a variable x, it says it's equal to two. Then it calls foo with x. Now what will happen is that two will get passed to foo. Uh, so x is equal to two, two gets passed to foo. But it gets copied to foo. So y, when you're executing foo, that parameter y is equal to two, it's a copy of two though. It is not the same two that x is pointing at. The x defined in main is a completely separate variable than the y defined inside foo. So when foo takes y, which is equal to 2, and adds 1 to it, it is changing y, but it is not changing x from the main. Okay, so that's the point to make, right? The, the called function cannot change the variables inside the calling function, like x in this case. So if you go back to the main, after I say foo x, when I print out the x, it prints out uh, what x originally was, which is 2, because x has not been changed. Even though foo, the function said y equals y plus one, that in no way touched x, right? Because y was only a copy of what x is. So that's call by value, that, um, that the, calling, the called function can't uh, affect, it, it just gets a copy of the variable, the parameters. So trade-offs of call by value, advantage is uh, data encapsulation. So the fact that the function cannot alter the, uh, the variables inside the, the caller is often considered a good thing because because uh, it limits the propagation of errors, right? So the, the called function, it, can't, it can make a mistake and can do something wrong, but it can't change the caller environment, right? It can't go and, it, and change the, the mess up the, argue, the variables of the function that, that, it call, that called it, right? And that would, it just, that would just allow bugs to spread out more, more fully across the, the different functions inside the code. So it, the function, uh, function errors are more localized and encapsulated when, uh, when you're using call by value. Now, a disadvantage is copying time. So what that means is call by value, you have to actually copy the arguments into the parameters. So for instance, uh, in the last example, 
this foo, it took an argument, had a parameter y. So this value for x, which is equal to 2, that 2 had to get copied into y so that the, the function has a copy of the, of the argument, right? So that took time. That took some amount of time to copy. Now, if it's just an integer, who cares? But if the argument is something big, like some gigantic slice or something like that, then it's a serious problem. So that's a disadvantage of uh, call by value. So an alternative to that is called call by reference. Now, call by reference is not uh, built into this language, meaning there is no, there's no uh, feature built into it, but you can do it manually, okay? All you have to do is pass a pointer. So instead of passing the argument that you want to pass, you pass a pointer. Now, remember, what I mean by this is, so a reference is a pointer, right? What I mean by this is, let's say you want uh, the function to actually alter the variables that are passed to it. Okay, so in like in the, the last example, there was that variable x in the main, and the foo could not alter that. But let's say I wanted the main, I wanted foo to alter that variable. So let's just look at this example. See if I show it again. We got this function foo, and it's basically saying y equals y plus one. It, but this time, notice that it doesn't take an integer as an argument. Y is now a pointer to an integer, star int. Okay. So it assumes that y is appointed to an integer. And then uh, it says star y equals star y plus 1. So that means the it, add, it takes the contents of what y is pointing to and adds, that, adds 1 to that. So it still does the same thing, but it takes an, uh, a pointer to, to y instead of an actual y. So it's, it takes a pointer to an integer instead of an actual integer. Now, in the main, if I look at the main, when I call it, instead of saying foo x, passing it a copy of, uh, of x, I say foo ampersand x. So what that does is it passes a pointer of x, a pointer to x, uh, passes that to foo. So now foo has a pointer to x. So foo has a copy of the location in memory where x is. So when foo modifies, uh, it says star y equals star y plus 1, it's modifying the data at that location. So it's modifying the actual x. And then when you print out uh, the, in the bottom of the main, when it prints out x, x would actually be equal to 3 after this. So this is a call by reference because you're not passing uh, the actual integer to, or the actual data to foo, to the function. You're passing a, a reference to it, a pointer to it. And when you pass the pointer, when foo gets a copy of the pointer, it knows where that, that value is in memory, so it can directly go into that location of memory and alter it. So then foo now has the ability to alter this variable x, even though x wasn't initially defined inside the scope of foo, it was defined inside the scope of main. So trade-offs are basically the opposite of uh, call-by-value trade-offs. So the advantage is copying time. So uh, you don't need to copy the arguments. So you still need to copy the pointer that you're passing, and that takes a certain amount of time. But if your argument is some big slice with 100,000 uh, elements in it, you don't have to copy that whole slice. You don't have to copy that whole structure, whatever it is. So that can save you a lot of time. Uh, a disadvantage is data encapsulation. So uh, the, actually, the advantage of call by re value is a, the disadvantage of by reference. Now, if there's a bug inside foo, it can alter the, the variables inside main, or whichever variables uh, you pass to it anyway, by reference. So that may be what you want, but it may not be what you want. And you just have to, be, have to pay attention to that uh, when you're writing your code. You only pass by reference if you definitely want the function to modify the variables in the calling function. Module 1, Functions and Organization. Topic 1.4, Passing Arrays and Slices. So say you want to pass an array as an argument to a function. Uh, maybe you want to do some processing on the array or something like that inside a function. So the arguments are all copied because this is called by value. So the whole array has to be copied to the parameters. And if the array is big, then this is a problem. It'll take a lot of time to copy. You also use an excessive amount of space. So uh, as an example of that, we got this function foo, and it takes as an argument an array of three integers. Three is small, but this is just an example. You can imagine that could be 300,000, right? So it takes an array of three integers, and uh, so that's declared there, x uh, square brackets three int, and it returns an integer, and it just returns the first element of the array, x bracket zero. So uh, the function main, that first defines an array, a, uh, a colon equal uh, just a, a three element array, one, two, three, 
and then it prints out whatever foo returns. So it calls foo with that array A, uh, which returns the first element, which would be a one, then it prints that out. So in this case, it has to copy that whole array uh, over, when it makes a function call, it copies that into X, the, the parameter of foo, and that wastes time, you know, if it's a long, long array. So what do you do? So one thing you can do about that is you can employ basically call by reference, right? So you can, instead of passing the array to foo, you can change foo so that it takes a pointer to an array. So that's what we've done here. Uh, function foo, instead of, if you look at, uh, at its argument, its parameter list, it says foo and then in parentheses, x is x star bracket three int. So it's a pointer to a three element array of integers. And then inside the function foo, it, all it does is it takes, uh, it takes star x, which is the po pointed to the array. So star x is actually the array, right? And it uh, looks at the zeroth element and adds one to it. So it increments, it should increment the zeroth element. Then if I look at the main, it uh, defines the array A. Then when it calls foo, it doesn't pass it A, it passes it ampersand A, passing the pointer to A. And then it just prints out A. And what should happen is since, uh, since the foo, since foo got the pointer to A, it can actually modify that array A, and it, uh, it should modify it by incrementing the first value. So if the array starts out as one, two, three, it should increment that one, so it's two, two, three. And then it prints out, prints the array, when it prints it, it prints out two, two, three. So you could do this. You could explicitly, you could dereference, use referencing and dereferencing operations to pass array pointers and use array pointers. Uh, but that's messy and it's not necessary in Golang. This isn't the way, the neat way to do it in Go. So the way you do it in Go is you use slices instead. In fact, uh, in general in Go, get used to using slices instead of arrays, <laughs> just in general. So a slice is like a window on an array, right? But remember that when you declare a slice, if you declare a slice from scratch, or make it, or however you make it, it'll make the backing array behind it, right? So you can almost always use a slice instead of an array. So, um, so passing a slice copies the pointer. So when you pass an array, it copies the whole array. But a slice is not actually uh, an array, it's actually, it's really a structure that contains three things. A pointer to, to the array, or a pointer to the start of the uh, slice in the array. Uh, it, and the length and the capacity, okay? So it is really a structure with those three pieces of data, one of which is a pointer, okay? So when you, so it's still, the, the Golang, Golang is still called by value, but when you pass a slice, since the slice contains the pointer, you're copying the pointer. So the called function actually, when you pass a slice, it actually gets the pointer uh, and also the length and the capacity. So it can use that pointer directly and modify the uh, the slice without having you without you having to explicitly dereference and reference like we did with the array example. So here's an example like that here with um, this foo function. This time it takes a slice. I'm calling SLI, and uh, notice that when you de declare the slice, you don't have to specify the size. In fact, you can't specify the size. You just give the square brackets. Uh, so it says SLI square brackets and an int. There's no number inside square brackets because it's a sli that, that means it's a slice. So you, you do that and it knows, okay, this function foo takes a slice as its parameter. And then, then, then what it does, is it takes a slice and just uh, adds one to slice element zero. Then if we look at the main, this time what we do is when we declare, we don't declare an array, we declare a slice. And it's only slightly different. So this time when we declare A, make that array, or rather not A, not array, it is a slice now. A colon equals square brackets int one, two, three. The only difference is I didn't specify a size, right? Inside the square brackets, I didn't put a three like I did when I declared an array. This time I just put square brackets. So now it recognizes that A is actually a slice. So then I can just call foo, pass the, sli the slice, or a, which is now slice, and uh, it'll, it works exactly the same as the last program. And so when you print a, it will have incremented the, um, the first element, which is, was one, so now it's two, so it'll print out two comma two comma three. So, uh, so th in general, in Go, try to use slices instead of arrays, okay? And specifically, when you want to pass an argument, an array argument, don't pass an array argument, pass a slice argument because then you don't have to do all the copying that's associated with, uh, with that, that would be associated with an array. Thank you. Module one, functions and organization. Topic 2.1, well-written functions. So we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, how, you, how you should write functions. Now this isn't actually necessarily specific to Go, 
But this is more, uh, you know, a good way to construct your code so that your code is well organized and easy to understand. Okay. And understandability, I'm, under, I'm highlighting this idea of understandability. It is important to be able to understand your own code for many, many reasons, okay? Uh, mostly for debugging, but also maintenance, other people interacting with your code. It needs to be understandable. And the way you write your functions, the way you define your functions, really impacts understandability. So if we look at a block of code, we could roughly say that a block of code is a bunch of functions and a bunch of data. So a bunch of functions that are the operations that you're going to perform and the data that you're going to perform the operations on. Okay, so you can see really any, any block of code, any program as a pile of functions and a pile of data somehow organized together. So you, when I say understandability, when I say, oh, this program is understandable, uh, here's what I mean. I mean that if you're asked to find a feature, you can find it quickly. So as an example, where in your function, where's a function that blurs the image? Say you're writing some graphics program. Where's a function that blurs the image? You can locate that. Now you might be asking that yourself, right? Because you found a bug, something's not working, and you need to find that piece of code. Or that could be you know, some kind of code review meeting or you're dealing with other people you're working with and they need to understand how your code works and they ask you this type of question. Maybe it's your boss, right? Your boss is like, look, where's the code that does this? And you will look like an idiot if you can't answer that. It's your code, you wrote it, you should know it, right? So you need to understand the organization of your own code. Now, a lot of this is memorization, but it's also a matter of organization. If you organize it well, it is much easier to find things. So, you know, where is the function that does this operation, blurring your image? Or where do you compute the average score? Whatever the, whatever the question is, where is the code that does this? Where is the code that does that? You need to be able to find that, okay? And that's an understandable piece of code. If you could find that pretty easily. And even better, if somebody else can find it. So if you write the code and you give it to somebody else because you're probably working on a team, right? And that other person can find where the, where the image is uh, blurred or where the average score is computed. If they can find it quickly, that's a real measure of understandability, right? And remember this too. I know a lot of students in my classes, they underrate how important this is, right? They think, oh, look, it's my code. You know, of course I understand my code. Right, So believe me, if you write a complicated piece of code and you walk away from that code for a month, you come back, you will lose track of what the heck that code did. You will, you will not understand your own code, okay? So it, you really want to construct in such a way that it is easy to figure out what the code, where these features are located inside your code. Now, another aspect of understandability is finding where data is used. Because often, you'll get, some, you'll get some kind of a problem where this data is incorrect. Okay, or this data is not just used, actually I said where data is used, also where data is used and where it's defined, right? So this data is, is incorrect, how did it get incorrect? You know, what part of your code actually affected that data? You know, that type of question you wanna be able to ask. So you wanna be able to trace through data. Be able to say this data, where is it used? Where is it defined? So where did you modify the, the record list, right? So you got some record list, you realize that record list, the contents of that list are wrong, right, while you're debugging. Where did you modify that? You gotta find that so you can find where the bug is, right? Uh, where did you access the file? Maybe this file has the wrong data and you wanna know what code that's affecting, right? So where did you access that file? Where did you access these different pieces of data? So this is what I mean by understandability. You need to be able to find a feature, find the code dedicated to a particular feature, find it quickly. Also, data that could be wrong, where is that data used and where is it, uh, where is it written to? So where is it used and where is it modified? You need to be able to find quickly. And uh, organization, writing your code, uh, writing your functions in an organized way really helps you with that. So very basic debugging principles, and there are a million debugging principles, but I'm gonna just be really basic now. So say you're, co you're running your code, the code crashes, and it crashes inside some function somewhere, right? So some function you wrote, it crashes on line 100, right, some function. So I can broadly say that there are only two ways that this could go wrong, two options for any kind of bug, okay? It could be that the function that failed is written incorrectly, okay? It just did the wrong thing. Okay, so maybe uh, as an example, it's supposed to sort of slice and it sort of in the wrong order. Okay, it did the wrong thing, right? So the function could do the wrong thing, or maybe the function is written perfectly well, but the data that the function uses is incorrect. So maybe this function is, uh, you know, it, it sorts the slice just fine, but the slice has wrong data in it, right? So somehow the data that it got was wrong, so when it does a sort, of course, its result's gonna be wrong, right? Because the original data was wrong. So 
the function that you're working on, it could be messed up, or the, its inputs could be messed up. Now, its inputs, remember, can come from the parameters, right? So there could be arguments that are passed to it, but its inputs don't have to come from there. They could come from um, you know, maybe a file or some user input or something like that. So you gotta think of all these inputs. Uh, so this is just my sort of high level debugging principle. And notice how I'm, I'm dividing this. I'm saying, look, either the function is written incorrectly or it's the data's fault. So it's the function written wrong or the data is at fault. Now, of course, when you trace that back, you'll see the data is probably incorrect because some function wrote it incorrectly. But locally, you can say, look, either this function is wrong or the data that it's working on is wrong. So in order to support debugging, when you run into a bug like this, first thing you gotta be able to do is understand your own function, okay? So functions need to be understandable. So when you look at that function, look at the code, you gotta be able to look through it and manually say, look, is this right? Is it doing what I think it's doing? You know, does it, it's actual behavior, does it match what I want, desired behavior? So your function needs to be written in an understandable way so that you can determine that without too much difficulty. The next thing though, is the data needs to be traceable. So what that means is, is maybe your function is perfectly fine, but there's some input data that it got passed that was, that somehow it accessed that was wrong, okay? So you need to be able to figure out where did that data come from? So you can follow back to where the original fault actually happened, right? Now, this, uh, this could be easy, it could be hard. Global variables, for one, complicate this. Because, see, one thing about having no global variables is that the inputs to the, to the function come straight from the parameters. So you know where every piece of data came from. It came from the caller, right? But if you use global variables, then they can come from whoever wrote to the global variables. And since these variables are global, anybody could have written to it. So it's much harder to trace back who's, you know, which function is at fault for writing the wrong data to a variable. That's exactly why global variables you should be careful about. And I'm not gonna say never use them, people use them, and there are reasons I use them sometimes. But just understand that they add this complication, they make it hard to debug, because you know, just because you know this data is incorrect, you don't know what the source of that, that was. And then you've gotta do something more complicated to figure that out. Thank you. Module one, functions and organization. Topic 2.2, .2, guidelines for functions. So I'm gonna give a few tips on uh, making good functions, okay? Functions that are understandable. To facilitate debugging and you know, other, other people understanding your code, working together with people and so forth. Modification later, you know, maybe you wanna update your code, you need to understand what you wrote. So to facilitate that, there are a few tips. Function naming, really important. Give functions a good name, for goodness sake, some kind of name that describes the behavior of the function. So you, what you want, your goal in the naming, if at all possible, is that the behavior can be understood at a glance. So you just look at the name and you know what this thing does. Now, uh, parameter naming counts too. So you also want parameters that are well named too, so you understand what they mean. So as an example, uh, I'm showing two functions just the first line of the declaration, declaration, right? The first function is called process array. It takes a, which is uh, an integer slice, and uh, it returns a float, and that's all I know about it right now, right? Now, if instead, uh, let's look at the bottom one, uh, which actually this, these two functions, these can do exactly the same thing, okay? But they're defined differently. They're declared a little bit differently. So the second one is called compute RMS. Uh, it takes in a, uh, a slice called samples of floats, and it returns a float. So uh, these two, notice that these two are compatible. These two are probably doing exactly the same, say they do exactly the same thing. That first line is declared the same way, but, uh, but their names are different. So process array versus compute RMS. Now RMS, uh, you, this, remember these names are always domain dependent, okay? Uh, RMS stands for root mean square. If you're looking at a time varying sim signal, it is something like an average, okay? Now, I don't wanna go into what RMS is, but if you know this type of stuff, you're in, if you're working in this domain, you would know what RMS is. So compute RMS has a distinct meaning to anybody working in this domain. So you look at that and you, and you know instantly what that is. Process array could mean anything, right? Process how, right? Who knows? Now then, also look at the name of the argument. Uh, for process array, the argument is called A, 
that's completely generic. Who knows what that is? Where uh, compute RMS, uh, I called it samples because guess what? It's a bunch of samples of a time varying signal, right? So the the set, the the naming gives you some kind of an idea of uh, what type of data is being passed, and I can look at it and understand what it's doing without knowing anything about the actual code inside the function about how it's implemented. I can just look at the name and say, ah, that's what it is. So that's what you want. Now, notice that um, these names, they're going to be domain dependent, right? So compute RMS, that's going to be, uh, you know, you have to know what RMS is. But that's a shorthand that anybody who does this type of work, who does, um, who works on time varying signals, they're going to know what an RMS is. So, uh, so that's a good name. Now, another thing about names that I sort of skipped here is that you don't want them to be too long, OK? You start, people can go overboard, right? They can make them so descriptive, they're just burdensome, OK? You don't want them to be too long. Now, how long is too long? I don't know. Uh, process array is getting there as long as I want it to be, maybe a little longer than that. There's no hard limit on that, but you don't want to put too many words together, right? It gets ridiculous. Uh, so, so anyway, that's uh, naming is really important. And, you know, in my classes, you know, I teach Python here at uh, this at UCI. And, you know, uh, I, I tell students this and they don't listen. They still name these variables X. And I'm like, what the heck? I, you know, and then they're like, oh, Professor Harris, what's wrong with the code? I have no idea. I don't know what X and Y and Z are. How am I supposed to know, you know? And nobody can know that. And sure, maybe you don't care what the professor thinks, but you will one day work with a group of people and your boss will be like, okay, what is this, <laughs> right? And they will, and he will get upset, he, she will get upset. You know what I'm saying? So you have to, if you want to work with people, naming is really important. And you yourself, when you look at the code later, like a month later, it will be much easier for you to understand your own code if you have good naming. All right, another thing that you want in function definitions is you would like to have functional cohesion. So what that means is that the function should perform only one operation. And note, I put operation in quotes because what is an operation? All right, I don't mean one instruction, you know, plus, minus, something like that. An operation, the size of it, the complexity of it, really depends on the context, okay, on what the application is that you're making. So uh, give you an example. Say you got some geometry application. I don't know. It's doing things with points in three dimensions, right? Uh, maybe you got some functions uh, like point dist, point dist for point distance. Tells you the distance between two points. Common thing you might do. Draw a circle, triangle area. These names are all things that are in the domain geometry, and these names are all good names, meaning you can look at the name and figure out what it does. And they're not too long, okay? So just from the name, you can look. You don't have to look inside the, the code. You can just look at the name. Now, what I mean by functional cohesion is you would like it if each function did basically one thing. So point distance, point dist, it computes one thing, the distance between two points. Draw a circle, it draws a circle. You know, it does one thing that makes sense in the domain of geometry applications in this case. Now let's say though that uh, you wanted, let's say inside, you, you making this geometry application and there's some case, some instance where under some conditions you need to draw a circle and then you need to compute the area of a triangle. Okay, there, you might have to do that. Do, that, do uh, the one thing and then the next. So it would be a bad idea to put both of those functions into the same, both those operations into the same function. You might say, well, I'm going to need to do both. I'll just put them into the same function, and it can draw a circle and it can, uh, you know, compute a triangle's area, right? One function that can do either or, let's say, right? That would be a bad mistake because now you've got a function that does two things. And the reason why it's a bad mistake is because it doesn't make sense to the human, meaning how would you name such a function? Draw a circle, compute triangle area. It doesn't, you know, it's much cleaner in your mind if the operations that the that the function performs are are separate. You know, uh, you know. So drawing a circle and computing a triangle area, they are two separate functions to most people who think about geometry, right? They're two separate things, so you'd want to keep them as separate functions. If you start putting them together, then it just doesn't make sense to the human, and you want it to make sense. Right? You basically, when you define this, when you write this code, you want it to be idiot proof, okay? You gotta expect that a bunch of idiots are working with you and they're gonna be looking at your code and they don't understand a thing. So you gotta make this code so easy and obvious for them that they can't help but understand what you're doing, okay? That's sort of what I'm going for here, right? You want it to be obvious. And putting together different functions, different operations into the same function is a confusing thing. So you wanna separate the, these functions, uh, these operations into different functions if you can. So another thing to do with functions, to make them simpler, is to reduce the number of parameters, okay? Limit the number of parameters that you take. So 
uh, more parameters just means more complication. Because if you're trying to understand what a function does, say it goes wrong, say it takes, you know, it has 20 parameters, you got to look at all 20 of these parameters, right? And s which one could it be, right? It's much easier if you have fewer parameters that you can keep track of. So, because debugging generally requires tracing the, the data, right? Would, and which of the parameters, right? So you have to trace that back. You don't want to have to trace back 20 different pieces of data. You'd like to trace back, you know, five or something like that. Or look through five pieces of data rather than 20. So the fewer, the better. Now, uh, so debugging is just generally harder when you have more parameters. So uh, a function, now you got to think of why it happens. Like say you do make a function that does have a lot of parameters. Okay, Why did that happen? It may be that the function that you wrote had bad functional cohesion. So let's say, for instance, you made the mistake I talked about before. You want a function that can draw a circle, or it can, uh, it can also compute a triangle's area. These two operations require entirely different arguments. Drawing a circle requires information about the circle, its center, its radius, basically. Drawing a, a triangle, computing a triangle's area requires uh, information about the triangle, maybe its points, its coordinates, or something like that. So if you make a function that does both of these operations, it's got to take all the arguments for both different things, right? And so you would tend to get more arguments, more parameters. So uh, it, so you want to reduce the number of parameters. You may want to look at the code and say, oh, wait a minute, I'm putting these two operations together. I can separate them and reduce the number of arguments to each, the number of parameters required to pass to each individual function. Okay, so another way to reduce the parameter number, to reduce the number of parameters, <clears throat> say, say you can't split it the way I just said. Say, uh, you know, these parameters, they are, say this function does have good cohesion, okay? So that's not a thing you can do is just split it. Uh, one thing you might look into is grouping related arguments into structures. So, uh, as an example, say you got a triangle area function. Uh, a bad solution for this, uh, when I say bad solution, a solution for passing it is the parameters. You could say its parameters are three points, okay? Because you need three points to define a triangle, right? So you got to give it three points. And each point, let's say, is in three-dimensional, three-dimensional space we're working in. So each point is going to have three floats associated with it, right, x, y, z. So in total, I could say this triangle area could take nine different arguments, right? x, y, z for the first point, x, y, z for the next, x, y, z for the next. It's a lot of arguments, right? A better solution, good solution, I'll say better solution, let's say. Not the best, but better solution, is instead I define a new structure called point. Right? And this structure called point, it has x and y and z. It has three floats, x, y, z. Then, once I define that, instead of passing to the, my triangle area nine different uh, values for x and y and z, x, y, z, x, y, z, I can pass it three things, three points. Now, each point inside it has three floats. But when I'm looking at my definite, my declaration for triangle area, I only see three things, point one, point two, point three. It makes more sense. It's easier to understand in my mind. Now, an even better solution that I didn't put up here is I could say triangle area takes one argument, which is a triangle. So I can make another structure, which is a triangle class, triangle type, rather. And this triangle, it could have three points associated with it, and each point has three floats. So I could make a triangle area that just takes one argument, which is a triangle structure, right? That's even better. So, um, so anyway, this, this type of thing, by grouping related pieces of data into structures, uh, you can get you can reduce the amount of uh, the amount of arguments that you have to pass to a function. Now, remember, don't force this, meaning only group pieces of data if they are actually related, right? You don't want to group completely random pieces of data into one structure, because then you get a structure that makes no logical sense. You don't want that, but in but often you can uh, you can find ones that are related and put them together. Thank you. Module one: Functions and Organization. Topic two point three: Function Guidelines. So another thing that you want to do with functions is you want them to be not too complicated, right? You want them to be understandable. They shouldn't be too complex. Now this term complex, uh, complexity, when you measure the complexity of a function, this is definitely arguable. People have different opinions on what comprises complexity, what makes up the complexity of a function. So uh, we'll start off with function length because that's sort of the most obvious, right? Everybody uses that as a very rough approximation of function complexity. So uh, functions need to be simple. And one way to make them simple is make them short, okay? Now, this doesn't always work because short functions can be complicated. I have definitely seen that, and especially in like a C or something. You can put everything into one line, right? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not counting lines that are, you could technically write a whole Go program in one line, right? Assuming you use regular line separations, uh, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about function length. And, you know, you could rely on, on number of lines, line count. In fact, I remember um, like one professor here, he basically insists for in C that all of his students write their code, every function is no longer than 10 lines, you know? Now, I think that's too strict. You know, sometimes you got to go over that. But I see where he's going with the idea, right? It forces you to have some measure of, of simplicity in each individual function. So the question then is sort of how do you write a complicated piece of code with these really simple functions, right? I mean, some, comp some code you write, it has to be complicated, and there's no real avoiding it, right? So what you can do is you, uh, when you define your functions, you can make sure that each individual function isn't too complex. You can make attempts to limit the complexity of an individual function. Uh, and what's gonna happen is in your code in general, there's always what, what I'm calling here a function call hierarchy, meaning you got a function and it calls some other functions, which calls some other functions and so on. So that's, I'll call that a hierarchy, right? This calls that, which calls that and so on. So you can use that hierarchy to simplify the complexity of each individual function. So as an example, I got option one. Option one, you write everything in one function, one big fat function, 100 lines long. Or I can go to option two. Now option two, I write, uh, now I have three functions. Instead of one, I've divided it into three. The first function in this case is really short, right? Just a few lines, but it calls the other two. And then the other two functions are each 50 lines long, right? So. This is an approximation of what you would do, but in option one, you got one big complicated piece of code, 100 lines long. In option two, you got three pieces of code, two of which are 50 lines long. But the complexity of each individual function, if you're measuring in terms of lines of code, is less in option two than in option one. So presumably option two would be easier to debug. Now, you know, this all depends on a bunch of other factors. Uh, so, for instance, you don't want to take a, a piece of code that's 100 lines long and just chop it straight in half and say, this is function, top half function one, bottom half function two, right? You got to group the functions in a reasonable way. We already talked about this. Uh, each function should map to uh, an operation that makes sense in your, in your application. So you can't, typically you can't just cut it in half. But you might be able to take this 100 line piece of code and say, well, the first 30 lines do this and the next 70 lines do that and maybe chop it up like that. And even that's an improvement, right? And then you can take the 70 line piece of code, that 70 line function and chop that up and do a 30 line chunk and a 40 line chunk and so on. So there's this decomposition hierarchy that you're making implicitly when you define these functions. And the goal is, part of the goal is, to make sure that each individual function isn't too complex. Okay, so you limit the complexity. Now, in this case, we're talking about complexity in terms of lines of code, but we'll talk about another form of complexity uh, next. Control flow complexity. So another way to look at the complexity of a, um, of a piece of code is to look at how much, how complicated its control flow is. So when I say control flow, I'm talking about the, the paths from the top of the function to the bottom, from the start to the end, the control flow paths. So how many options there are. So for instance, if you had a piece of code that had no if statements, just straight line code, just a sequence of assignments, let's say, assign, 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 that has exactly one control flow path from top to bottom. There is one sequence of instructions that you will execute in that code. So one control flow path. But if you put an if statement in there, if this is true, you do one thing. If that's true, you do the other. If you put one if, then you got two paths, right? Now, Code gets more complicated than that. You can have nested if statements. You can have loops, which are implicitly conditional statements and things like this. So a typical function can have many different control paths, many different sequences of instructions that are executed when you execute that code, many different sequences that are executed depending on the input parameters, right? So here I got this uh, function, actually here I got this function uh, foo, and it's got two conditionals. Actually one's nested within the other. So if a is equal to one, then, uh, then you go into this uh, next conditional if b is equal to one. So if I look at this code, I'd say this has three control flow paths. Assuming there's no other control flow operations here, you got three paths, three paths. Uh, one is where a, a is equal to zero. If a is equal to zero, a or if, sorry, not if a is equal to zero, if a is not equal to one. If a is not equal to one, then you skip that whole inner, uh, inner conditional, the if b equal one, and you just finish and to go to the end, okay? So that's one, one path. A is not equal to one. Then another path is A is equal to one, but B is not equal to one. Then another path is A is equal to one and B is equal to one. 
And in each one of those three conditions, uh, three sets of conditions, you're executing different sequences of instructions inside this program. So uh, there are three control flow paths inside this piece of code. Now, one way to measure the, con the complexity of a piece of code is how many control flow paths does it have? So I can say, look, this has three. So say I want to simplify that, and I might be able to use functional partitioning to reduce the uh, control flow complexity a little bit. So say I take that function foo, and uh, now I take, you remember it had two conditionals, right? So now what I've done is I defined two functions, and, and I've separated the conditionals, split them out across the two different functions. So now foo still has the first conditional, if a equal equal one, still got that. But then the next conditional check, uh, it doesn't exist anymore inside that function. Instead, it calls a function called check B. Now, if you look at check B on the other side, that has the other conditional. If B is equal to 1, then whatever. So I've separated these two conditionals. Now, now that I've done this, the foo function now has two paths through it. A is equal to 1, and A is not. And then B, uh, check B, it has two paths. B is equal to 1, and B is not. So now each one of these functions has two control flow paths instead of the three control flow paths that I had when I merged them together. Okay, So this is just a tiny example, but the idea is you can separate the conditionals into different functions and reduce the, the, the max complexity, right? the max number of control flow paths. You can reduce that overall, making the code easier to, uh, to debug, typically. Thank you. Module 2, function types, topic 1.1, first class values. So we've been talking about functions in this class already. Uh, you can't really program in Go without using functions. So you've always got to have at least the main function. And we've had that in all the examples that we've used. But uh, what we're going to talk about now is the ways in which Go allows you to treat a function as a first class value. So there's this term, uh, first class value, treating functions as first class values. And it's associated with functional programming. Functional programming is a way of programming, a programming paradigm, let's say, that is different than what people usually use, let's say. So if you've ever programmed in Scheme or something like that, that's a functional programming language. Um, ML, there are a bunch of these languages. And so it's a different way of thinking. And we're not going to really do a lot of programming, a lot of functional programming. But there are some features of functional programming that can be very useful. So uh, Golang implements some of these features. And we'll talk about how to use those. So treating a function as a first class value generally means uh, being able to treat a function as a, like any other type, like an integer, a string, a float, all the things that you can do to one of those types, you can also do to a function. So uh, as an example, uh, variables can be declared to be a function type. So you can always declare a variable to be an integer type, a floating point type, things like that. You can also declare it to be a function type. Uh, and you can then set a variable equal to a function. Uh, you can create them dynamically. So in your code, you can create an integer on the fly, right? You just, in the middle of your code, you can create a new variable, uh, you know, x colon equal whatever, and uh, x colon equal three, whatever, and that creates an integer on the fly at runtime while you're running the code. So that's creating a, a variable dynamically, creating some type dynamically. You can do that with functions too. Now, up until this point, we haven't done that. We create them statically. You know, just at the top level, you say func main or something like that, but uh, we want to be able to create them dynamically too. Sometimes that's very useful. So inside a function, you can create a new function right inside. Functions can be passed as arguments to other functions and returned as values from other functions. So uh, just like an integer or float or something like that, you can pass it as an argument. You can pass an, a function as an argument to a function. Or a function can return a new function as its, as its return value. Also, it can be stored as a, a data structure, in a data structure. So you can have a data structure, maybe a slice. Uh, you can have a slice of integers, something like that. You can also have a slice of floats. So in all these ways, uh, Golang is going to allow us to treat a function as a, uh, just like a regular type. So uh, let's talk about how to implement these things in Go. Start off with uh, func variables as functions. So one thing you'd like to be able to do sometimes is declare a variable as a function. So the variable basically acts as an, as an alias, another name for that function in this case, if we do this uh, the way we're doing it right here. So if you look at the, the, uh, the example code, see in red, we got that uh, variable that we're declaring right at the top called funcvar. And that is going to be my new variable that I'm declaring to be a, a function type. 
So if you look at the top line, var func var, and then to the right of it, uh, I give its type. I mean, that's how you do it. So that's how you declare uh, variables of certain types. You say var func var. Let's say I want it to be an integer. I'd say var func var int. So now I want it to be a function. So I say var func var func, and I give the argument type, integer, right? And I give its return type. So that right there, func int in parentheses, and then int to the right of func var, you'd call that a, a signature, a function signature. And so you have to put that to the right uh, of the, the variable name in the declaration. So that first line just declares a new variable called func var, which it will be able to be uh, assigned to a function. Now then right after that, I declare a function, uh, inc function, inc fn, and it just does increment, uh, right? It takes, an x, it takes a value x and it increments, it returns x plus one. So it's just a function. Now in the main, first thing I do is I say func var equals inc fn. So right there, I am assigning func var to be that, that function inc fn. Now notice in that assignment there, I don't put the parentheses to the right of inc fn. So normally when you, when you uh, write a function, when you call a function, you'd put parentheses, open paren, close paren, to the right of it. So if I wanted to call inc fn, I'd say inc fn, open paren, close paren, uh, you know, put, some put some parameters inside the parentheses, but that's how you call it. You put those parentheses. We are not calling it here though. Right? So all we're doing is we're saying func var is basically appointed to the same function, to inc fn. So we just do an assignment, just as shown. And then, once I've done that, I can use func var just the same as I would use that, that function name. So you can look at the last line. I'm doing a print. I say print func var 1. That's the same as saying print inc fn 1. Pass 1 to the function. It executes it. It increments it. It should print out a 2. So in this way, the variable is now is, is, can be assigned directly to a function. So this is treating a function as a first-class object. Uh, functions can also be passed as arguments to other functions. So you can see that here. I got this function called apply it. And all it's supposed to do is apply, apply a function to an integer. So uh, it takes two arguments, my function apply it. The first argument is a function. I call it a func. And its type is func. Func uh, takes an integer and returns the integer. The second argument is a value, which I'm calling an integer. And the whole point of this function, uh, this whole function, apply it, should uh, basically take that function, that's argument, that is its argument, apply that to the val argument, and it should return an integer. And if you look at what the function does uh, in between the curly brackets, all you have is return a func val. So it takes whatever that function is that you passed, passes the value to that function, and returns its return value. So in this way, we're passing functions, as, uh, passing a function as an argument to another function, which is useful sometimes, and we'll we'll talk about that. Uh, so here's sort of a bigger example, a slightly bigger example, where we're passing a function as an argument. Again, at the top, we've got that apply it that I told you about, right? So we're just going to show how to how you might use uh, such a such a function. So apply it is a function. It takes a function as an argument, and it applies the the argument function to the other argument, the val argument. Now then right after I define that, I define two other functions, an inc function and a dec function, increment, decrement functions, and they do what you would expect, return x plus 1, return x minus 1. So we got those two functions. Then we look at the main, and uh, there are two print statements. I call apply it uh, both times, apply it with the inc function as the argument, and then apply it with the dec function. So when I call apply it with the inc function, the other argument is, is 2, right? So an inc function should increment that, so it should print out a 3. And then the next print, uh, the next print statement says uh, apply, calls apply it with the dec function, decrement function. It passes it a two, so it should return a one, and so a one should get printed out. So if you run this code, you should get a three and a one. Anonymous functions. So anonymous functions are basically functions without a name. So you don't actually need to name a function if you don't want to. Now, it is usually very useful to name functions. If you want to call them, you need a name for them, right? Uh, but if you're going to pass a function as an argument to another function, often you don't need to give it an explicit name. So you saw on the last slide, last set of sl last slide just now, I had this inc function and dec function, uh, that I, and I gave them names and I passed them to my apply it function. But I can I don't have to actually give them names in order to pass them as arguments. I can just make the function right there in the call. Uh, they call this lambda calculus. This is this is a lambda and in comes from lambda calculus, but uh, we won't use those terms, but that's a math term that people, people where this actually came from, because these ideas of passing these functions around came from lambda calculus um, a long time ago. But if we look at the function, we still got the same apply it. But if you look at the main, 
I call apply it, and the first argument is a function definition, right? So without a name, there's no name for it, but it is otherwise a function definition. So I have it highlighted in red. Func uh, takes x uh, integer as an argument, returns an int, and in curly brackets, return x plus 1. So that's the increment function, but I never gave it the name inc function. I don't have to. I just define the function right there, define it without a name. So it is now called an anonymous function, and I can just pass it directly to apply it. And I didn't really need the name, right? Apply it will just apply that function. The name Names are more useful if you're going to call this function directly in your code. You want a name to associate with it. But in a case like this, you don't need a name. You can just make the function and just pass it as an argument. Thank you. Module 2, function types. Topic 1.2, returning functions. Functions can also return other functions as their return value. So uh, why would you do such a thing? <laughs> OK, that's a good question. Uh, one reason to do it is if you want to make a new function that's sort of a special purpose parameterizable function. So you want to change something about the function according to some kind of input data. You want to make a new function that acts differently, that's parameterizable. So you can create that. You can have a function create a new function which has a different set of parameters. So to give you an example of, uh, of something like this, and by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll admit, it took me a while to think of this example. Okay, So this isn't like a common thing that people do a whole heck of a lot anymore. But, uh, but you know, there, I can imagine uses for it. And it's kind of interesting to think about it, about all the things you could do once you start thinking about returning new functions that have different properties. OK, so here's my example. I want to find a distance to origin. I want a function that computes the distance to the origin. So it takes a point x, y coordinates of a point, and it returns the distance to the origin. So basically, it's going to perform Pythagorean theorem to find the distance, right? Now, what if I want to be able to move the origin, right? I remember vaguely in physics, you know, you might want to move the origin. Maybe I don't want it to, you know, here I want it on top of the car, depending on the problem, right, which is moving. Who knows? But I might want to change the origin. So the distance to the origin is going to change depending on what these, the origin is, right? So I can think of the origin, the location of the origin, as a set of parameters to this function. And I would like to make a new function, a function for each different origin. So maybe I want a distance to origin function that assumes one origin, and then another distance to origin function that assumes a new origin. Maybe the origin is moving for some reason, which actually happens in physics. So, uh, so let's take a look at how we, we might do that. Uh, so a way we could do it is we can make a function that defines a function and it returns a function. So this function is called make dist origin, right? And the point of this function is to create the function that I want, this distance to origin function. So if we look down at the bottom of this function, you can see it says return fn, right? So it, what it's going to do is it's going to define a function inside it, and then it's going to return that function as its uh, return value. So the, if you, let's look at the, uh, go back to the top. Uh, make distance to origin, it takes several arguments, OK? The, the arguments right there are uh, o, Z, o, o, X, O, Y, right? These are two floats. Now, uh, these two floats are supposed to be the origin. The O stands for origin in this case. So the O, X, and O, Y are the, are the origin locations, right? So if I want my origin to be 0, 0, those first two arguments would be 0, 0. Uh, so wherever I want my origin, I pass that as arguments to this, uh, to this make distance origin function. Now, the return value of this make distance origin function is a function. And you can see that in the second line, line 2, func uh, two arguments, float 64, float 64, returns 1, float 64. So the, uh, the two arguments to this, of this return value, those two floats, are going to be the x and y coordinates that we, whose distance we want to compute to the origin. And then the uh, last float, 64, is the return value, which is going to be a float, which is the actual distance. Okay? So just to get this straight, this make distance to origin function, it has two arguments, which, is, which are the uh, x, y coordinates of the uh, origin. And it has a return value, which is a function, which is going to compute the distance to that origin that we passed as arguments. Now, if we look into the function, line 3, we have a uh, variable called fn. And that's going to be the function that we're creating. So fn colon equals, and you notice we're defining a new function. Func uh, x comma y to floats and returns a float. And uh, this new function that we're creating, it returns math.square root, so it computes square root. It's doing Pythagorean theorem. Uh, math.pow x minus o, o x, right? So I take the difference between the x coordinate and the origin, the origin's x. 
and I square that, and then I do the same thing. Uh, I add that to the to y squared, so it's y minus its origin with a y component of the origin squared, and then I take the square root of that. So that's just Pythagorean theorem. So it, it does a Pythagorean theorem, and notice that it takes the x y coordinates that you want to find, whose distance you want to find from the origin, subtracts the x from the origin's x, y from the origin's y, does Pythagorean theorem and then it returns that function. So this make dist origin function doesn't actually compute the Pythagorean theorem, it returns a function whose job it is to do Pythagorean theorem, to compute Pythagorean theorem with the, uh, to figure out the distance from an origin, ox comma oy. So this is a function that is made special purpose, uh, this actually it creates special purpose functions. So notice, I could use this function, this make dist origin function to make many functions. I can make one distance to origin function that computes the distance to one origin. I can make another one that computes the distance to a different origin. So I can make as many as I want with di different origins. And so the origin is now built into the return function. Okay, so uh, now let's look at how we might use this. In my main, I, I'm going to create two functions. I say, look, I want to have two origins. I want to have uh, origin 0, comma 0 and another origin at 2, comma 2 for one reason or another in my problem. I need two different origins. So dist1 is going to be the function that computes the distance to, the, to origin 0, 0. Dist2 is going to be the function that computes the distance to origin 2, 2. And you can see me defining those in the first two lines. I just call make dist origin with 0, 0 and then 2, 2. Then I, uh, the last two lines, the print lines, they just print the, they compute the distance from uh, 2, 2 to the origins. So the first one uses dist1. So it computes the distance from 2, 2 to the origin 0, 0, which is about 2.1 something. Uh, so that's what we print out. Where the second one computes the distance from 2, 2 to origin 2, 2, which it should be 0. So that you print that out and you'd get 0 for that. So what we've done is we've made two special purpose functions. Uh, by and we needed we, we made them special purpose by giving them parameters, specifically the origins, right? The origins are the parameters that we used to make the function. So uh, this is something that's kind of a cool use of, uh, of returning a function, right? A function can create a new function that, that serves a, a sort of a catered, a special purpose. Now, every function has an environment. Uh, an environment is a set of all the names that are valid inside the function. Okay, all the variables and other things you define that you can refer to inside that function. So uh, this includes all the names that are defined locally in the function, any variables that you create in the function. But also it, it, so it uses lexical scoping. Uh, Golang is lexically scoped. So what that means is the variable can access, the function rather, can access variables that are in the, uh, that are in, defined in the block where the function is defined. So in the example code down there, we got this function foo. Now, the variables that I have highlighted in red, those are all inside its environment. So let's take z. z is defined inside foo, so clearly it's, it's, it's within z, foo's scope, or uh, foo's, uh, foo's uh, environment. Actually, notice how I use the word scope to refer to environment. People do that all the time. It's very common. This is not technically correct. I think you're supposed to use the term environment rather than scope. So anyway, the variable z is defined inside foo, so it's inside foo's environment. Uh, the variable y is a local variable to foo. It's, a, it's one of its parameters, right? So that is also inside the environment of foo. So foo can access y and z. Now, the variable x is defined uh, in the same block as the function foo is defined. So foo can see that variable x too. So let's say this whole, uh, th this piece of code is all defined inside another function, right? This variable x is defined in the same place, the same uh, block as foo is defined in. So foo can has access to that too. So all those variables highlighted in red are within the environment of foo, all the variables that foo has access to and can, uh, can use when it's executing. So uh, that's what an environment is, and that's important when you start passing around functions as arguments, the environment goes along with the function. So there's a term, closure. A closure is a function plus its environment. Right together. In fact, uh, in Go, it's probably I think it's implemented actually directly as some kind of, as a struct. Uh, you have a pointer to the function, a pointer to the environment, and they're put together. So when you pass a function as an argument to another function, you're also passing its environment with it. So what that means is when you eventually execute this function that you just passed, it still has access to its environment, the environment where it was defined. 
So uh, what implications does this have? This makes, sometimes it makes uh, figuring out the variable values kind of confusing. But just remember that the closure, the environment of that function goes with the function when you pass it as an argument. So let's take an example. Uh, this again is a make distance to origin function, right? Now the function that we that it defines uh, fn equals func that that function, that function it has an environment, and notice that o underscore x and o underscore y are part of its environment. Okay, that's important, right? They are a part of its environment. So when you execute uh, that function later, so when so this make distance to origin, it's going to return this function. And later on, when that function that you return gets executed, it still has access to the same environment. So O underscore X and O underscore Y that it had when it was defined, that were passed to make this origin, those variables are still accessible to this function when you call it later. Okay, so that's why, so basically what I'm saying is it remembers these, these origin values, the O underscore X, O underscore Y, that gets carried with the function. And so when you execute the function, it's still using the same origin values, O underscore X, O underscore Y, when it gets executed. So that's called a closure. And when you pass a function as an argument, you pass this closure. The function plus this environment together, they go together. So that, and you have to remember that when you're, eva when you're trying to figure out uh, how these functions get evaluated, where the variables are coming from, they're coming from this closure, from where, where it was defined, because that's how, how, uh, how Golang is scoped, it's lexically scoped. So it gets this environment from where it was defined. Thank you. Module two, functions and organization. Topic 2.1, variadic and deferred. So we've been talking about functions generally. Uh, we're gonna talk about a few more variations on functions, about how you can pass the arguments and how you can get them to execute at different times. Uh, one useful tool is to be able to pass a variable number of arguments to the function. So uh, normally when you define a function, you have to hard code the arguments that it takes. So if it takes um, you know, three arguments, you list them, comma separated inside parentheses. But sometimes you wanna make a function that takes a variable number of arguments. So, uh, and there are a lot of functions like this. Maybe you wanna take a number of integers and you don't know how many integers. If you take two, you take 10, you can still work with them and do the same thing with the, with the whole set of integers, regardless of how many is taken. So in that case, you, uh, you would like to be able to pass it a variable number of arguments. You can do that using this ellipsis uh, ellipsis character, not character really, but ellipsis is just three dots, okay? Three period dots in a row. And you put that there inside the argument list to specify that you wanna have a variable number of arguments. So, uh, and inside the function, when you get this argument, it looks like a slice. So if we look at the function there, it's called get max, and it's supposed to get the maximum integer out of a, a, a set of integers that you pass it as an argument. So if you pass it two integers or 10 integers or whatever it is, it should go through all those integers, find the greatest one, and return that. So we want to be able to take a variable number of arguments. So you can see highlighted in red, I say vowels dot, 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 int. So it takes an integer, but that dot, dot, dot before integer means it can take as many integers as you want to take. So then inside the, uh, inside the function, this vowels argument is treated like a slice of integers. So uh, the function just basically, uh, you can see what it does. It just goes through this whole, uh, actually you can see the for loop, right? It goes through the range of vowels, so it just iterates through all these, uh, all the integers inside vowels, finds the biggest one, sets max v to whichever one is the biggest, and then in the end it returns max v. So, uh, so this is just a useful tool. You can take a variable number of arguments, just use this ellipses, this dot, dot, dot inside the argument list, and you can treat the, uh, the argument, the parameter, just like a, uh, just like a slice. Now, another variation on that is, let's say, rather than, uh, say you got some, one of these variadic functions, it takes a variable number of arguments, you can pass it a comma separated list of arguments. So say, I, say for my get max, I want to pass it five, uh, five integers. I could pass it uh, one comma two comma three comma four comma five, you know, as many as I want, right? Uh, which is what I do actually in this example right here. You can see get max one comma three comma six comma four. And I can make that list as long as I want. But another way to pass a variable number of arguments is to just, to just pass it a slice. So that one comma three comma uh, six comma four, that could already be prepackaged in a slice. And then you could pass the slice to this uh, get max function. So that's what I'm doing uh, below. V slice, my slice is equal to a uh, slice of one, three, six, four. And then I pass that uh, in the, the last line where I do the print line. I say, uh, I call get max and I pass it v slice, which is my slice. Now notice, 
when I do that, that right after the word V slice, I have the ellipses again. So period, dot, 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 you have to put that there so that it, uh, so that it knows that instead of passing uh, a comma separated sequence of arguments, you're gonna, this V slice is meant to be uh, a slice of all the arguments put together. But once you do that, you can just pass the entire slice to the function and it works fine. So another thing that is sometimes useful with functions is to have a deferred function call. Deferred functions mean that they don't get called, they don't get executed right where they're called. They get executed later. So when the surrounding function completes, they get executed. So typically you use this for cleanup activities. So say you're doing something, opening files or doing whatever you're doing, maybe you'll have a deferred function which closes all the files at the end or something like that. So the, this function doesn't actually get called until the, the surrounding function is done and say you're done with all the files that you're interested in, then it gets called as you're exiting and closes all the files. So it does some kind of cleanup activity. So this is a common, uh, common thing to use it for, is for this type of cleanups afterwards. So as an example, we got our main function right here. First thing we do is we call, oh, wait, all you do to do the defer is you just put the keyword defer in front of the function call. So here we got uh, defer uh, print line. So defer FMT print line by. Now it's, and then the next line is just FMT print line hello. Now if they were executed in the order that they're written, you would print by and then hello. But of course, since we, uh, since we deferred it, what will happen is hello will get executed first. Then defer will not be executed until the main function, the surrounding function, actually completes. So what will actually get printed is hello and then by. So one thing to remember about these deferred arguments, deferred function calls, is that the arguments are not evaluated in a deferred way. The arguments are evaluated immediately, but the call is deferred. So what does that mean? Sometimes it doesn't mean anything. You know, if you just pass it, uh, pass the, the function some kind of a fixed argument that can't change, that doesn't need evaluation, then it doesn't mean anything. But if you pass it an argument that needs to be evaluated, you have to note that if, that argument is evaluated right there where the defer statement is, uh, not later when the call actually happens. So as to show this, we got a main. Then this main, uh, you can see in there that there's a defer print line and then there's a format.print line at the end. But there's also this also a variable called i. i set it equal to one. Now when I do the defer, I say print line i plus one. Now at the point where that defer statement is, i equals one, so i plus one equals two, so a two should get printed. But then notice that I, the line after that, I say i plus plus, and then I say, uh, I print hello. And remember that defer will not be executed until later after the whole main is complete. So by the time that deferred statement, that deferred print line executes, the value of i will actually be two, right? Because i starts off at one as one, it gets incremented plus plus. So it should be two by the time you actually execute that deferred statement. And then if you were to evaluate the argument at that time, you would say i plus one, two plus one, three, a three would get printed. What actually gets printed is a two because that i plus one is evaluated right there when the defer statement, uh, when it hits the defer statement, the i plus one is evaluated. And at that time, i is a one, so i plus one is a two. So later when the, uh, the deferred statement actually gets executed, it still prints a two. Thank you. Module three, object orientation in Go, topic 1.1, classes and encapsulation. So classes are part of object-oriented programming paradigm. And this class, this whole course is about, is for intermediate level people, right? So I'm assuming that people already have exposure to programming. And so it is most likely that you already understand what object-oriented programming is. Although I will sort of redefine it right now, uh, make sure we have a common understanding. And uh, there's always this question, you know, does Golang support object-oriented programming? I'll say, yes, it does. It doesn't have classes exactly, but it has something equivalent. It allows most of the same features. So uh, just to say what a class is though, to start, what a traditional class is that you would have seen in many other languages. Uh, class is basically a collection of data fields and functions that share a well-defined responsibility. So it's data, data fields, and functions put together, uh, usually called methods. You call them methods when they're in a class. So data and methods put together. So as an example, uh, say we want a point class, right, that represents some point in 2D space. So uh, using a geometry program I'm making, okay. So uh, the data would be, might be the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate of the point. And that's data that you would associate with a point. 
the functions, there might be a variety of functions, but maybe I've got distance to origin, quadrant, returns the quadrant that the point's in, add x offset, add y offset, set x, set y. There are a lot of functions that I could, I could uh, put in here. But the point is, though, that the data and the functions are all related to the same concept. Okay, there is a point in a, a two-dimensional point, and these functions are all things that you do to two-dimensional points. And the data is all the data that's associated with two-dimensional points. So that's what a class is. Now remember, a class is actually a template. So the class contains data fields, but not data. What that means is when you make this point class, I'm telling you, I'm giving a template on how a point should be created. I'm saying, here's the data that a point should have, and here are the functions that should operate on that data. But I am not actually providing the data. So a point class is really a template for a point. An actual point has to have data, has to have an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate uh, associated with it. So an object uh, is, is an instantiation of a class, an instance of a class. Uh, so it contains actual data. So as an example, say in my geometry program that I'm trying to make, I have a triangle, and this triangle has three points on it, three uh, coordinates, 0, 0, 6, 0, 5, 5. So there are three point uh, objects that I want to create, and three, and I call these objects now. These objects, they're made based on the point class template, so they have x coordinate and y coordinate, just like the template says, but uh, they have actual values for those. So the zero comma zero point will have zero and zero for the x, and five comma five point is five and five, and so on. So for one class, you can have many many objects of that class that instantiate that class, uh, that have actual data in them that fill in the data fields. So I just want to make clear the difference between a class and an object. Encapsulation is another concept that's often, it's usually associated with, um, with object-oriented programming. Actually, you know what, I would say it's, it's associated with the use of abstraction in general, but right now we're talking about it in the context of object-oriented programming. And the idea behind encapsulation is that uh, you might want to protect data, you might want to uh, hide data from the, the programmer. Okay, so the, when I say the programmer, I mean the programmer who is using your class. So the person who's defining the class, you can't hide anything from that person. But if there's a programmer who's using your class, you might want to hide some uh, data, conceal something. So you might want to make the data, allow the data only to be accessed using the methods that are part of the class. So rather than allowing the programmer to just go straight in and modify, like say it's a point, just go straight in and modify the x and the y values of the point, we might instead say, look, if you want to modify it, you have to use this method to modify it, the method that's provided in the class. And why would you do this? Maybe we don't trust the programmer to keep the data consistent. That's the main thing. Not that we don't trust the programmer, but the program has a lot of things on his or her mind, might make a mistake, right? So we want to relieve the programmer of that burden of dealing with the consistency, the internal consistency of the data. So we just say, look, programmer, if you use these methods to modify the internal data, then we, the people who made the class, guarantee that the data will stay consistent. Okay, so you as a programmer, you don't have to think about that, just use our methods. So that's encapsulation, where you say, look, the internal data can't be accessed directly from the outside, or at least part of it can't be accessed directly from the outside. You uh, basically put up a wall, an abstraction barrier, a hard abstraction barrier, which are the, the methods that you use to access the data. So as an example, let's say I want, uh, say I've got a point and a function that I want to do to this point is to double its distance from the origin, right? So I want to double its x and double its y, so it's twice as far along the line between it, between the origin and the point, you want to move that point, uh, you want to scale it to double it, right? Double its distance. So you got to double the x and double the y. So option one is to make a method uh, to encapsulate, right? So you make a method called double distance and it does exactly that function. Uh, that's a safer way. Another way is to say, look, I don't want to make that method. I'll just let the programmer directly access the x and y, and the programmer can double the x and y when, when they want to. The problem with that is that what if the, tr the programmer makes a little mistake and doubles the x but forgets to double the y, or doubles the x and triples the y, or whatever. Whatever the mistake, if a mistake like that happens, then the x and the y values inside the object are now inconsistent with each other. And, and so a mistake was allowed to be made, where if you force them to use this double dist function that you made, and you know you debugged it correctly, then they can't make such a mistake. Thank you. Module 3, Object Orientation in Go, Topic 1.2, Support for Classes. So uh, there's no class keyword in Go. So Go doesn't officially have anything called classes, although it has something that's just like them, but it doesn't have a class. So uh, other object-oriented language, OO object-oriented language, they have this class keyword, 
and then the data fields and the methods that are associated with the class, they're defined inside the, the block defined by the class, okay? So the code that I'm showing here is not Go. The code is uh, Python, yeah, looks like Python that I wrote. And uh, this is to make a point class in Python, just as an example. So in this case, uh, you got, um, you say class point, and then everything in that block is associated with the, the point class. Now, I'm defining a function called in, init, which is its constructor. And you'll notice inside there it defines self.x equals, self.y equals. So self.x, self.y, those are the, the data that are associated with the point, and we're assigning them its initialization function, so it's assigning them to values x and y values. But uh, this is normally how it's done in other object-oriented languages. Go does not, does not do it in the same way. It doesn't have a class keyword like this. But you can get similar effect. Okay, so in Go, uh, they have a different way of associating methods with data. So remember, that's what a class really is. A class is a bunch of data associated with a bunch of methods that operate on the data. And together, the methods and data make what, what you would consider to be a class. So you need to have a way to associate a method <clears throat> with, with some data. And the way that's done inside, um, inside Go is using a receiver type. So when you define the function, you give it what's called a receiver type, which is the type that that method is associated with. So the data is going to be some type. And the method, the way you associate the method with that data is you define, when you define that function, you give it a receiver type. And that receiver type is the type that that method is associated with. And then when you want to call the method, you use standard dot notation to, to call it. So let's show an example. So let's say I make up a new type called my int, and it's just an int. Okay, so type my int int, uh, but it's my int. So I can make up methods for my for this type. By the way, I can't add methods, associate methods with existing types. Actually, as a rule, you can't. Whenever you associate a method with a type like this, using a receiver type, making a, associated with a receiver type, you got to make sure that the type is defined in the same package as the method that you're associating with it. They have to be in the same package. And so you can't do that with like a built-in type like int or string or something like that. You can't just add methods onto that because they're not, they're, bu they're built in. You can't, they're not defined in the same package as, as your code. So I make my int. Now I make a function, this function double. And I want to associate double with the my int type. So double is going to be something that, you know, it's going to double an integer, and it only works on my ints. So when I define the function, notice it uh, is slightly different than a normal function definition. Before the name of the function double, to the left of that, highlighted in red, I have the receiver type defined. So my int is the receiver type, and mi is the, uh, the variable that refers to the particular uh, receiver receiver object that this double is going to be called on, okay? Because remember, when I call double, when I invoke double, I'm going to say, um, I'm going to have to say, you know, uh, say I have an, in actually, let's look, let's look at the invocation down here. Actually, if you look at the bottom, func main, I declare a my int of v, v colon equal my int 3. So I make it, and that's what v is. Then when I call, you can see highlighted in red, when I call double, I say v dot double. And so, uh, it, what happens is when it's trying to figure out this double, it looks back at the thing to the left of the dot, the object to the left of the dot, looks what type it is, and it knows, oh, that's the double that I want. The double is associated with that type. So, uh, so that's what the dot notation is for. It basically, the thing, the object to the left of the dot tells you what uh, type you're looking for, what type you're, so the double, because uh, double could be defined in lots of different types, but I'm specifically looking for double for V's type, which is uh, a my int. So, Anyway, back to the definition of my of my of the double uh, function for my int, the double method. I have to associate it with the my int type by putting the uh, m i my int in parentheses, the highlighted red part, before the name of the function when I define the function when I declare the function. So, uh, and then what happens is inside the definition. So, if we look inside double, it just returns int uh, m i times two. Now, notice that. It takes M, mi, now is, uh, it refers to mi, because basically what's happening is that mi, that object to the left of the dot, when you make the call, that object is, ends up being an argument, an implicit argument to double. We'll talk about that in a second. But it takes, uh, so this function just takes mi, whatever integer it is, multiplies it times 2, turns it to an integer, and returns it as an integer. And so then in the main, I can just call v.double, and it, uh, it calls the double that is associated with the type of v, which is my int. 
So what I'm showing here is just that this type myint is the receiver type for this function double that I have defined. So whenever I call double, I have to um, prefix it with this, using this dot notation, I prefix it with an object of that type, of my, the myint type, so v.double, so that the, um, the machine knows, okay, this is the double that I want, the one that's associated, that where this uh, myint is the receiver type. Implicit method argument. So what I'm saying here is that uh, even though it looks like double takes no arguments, right? If I look at the definition of double, there's no arguments there. But there is an implicit argument. Whenever you uh, have a receiver type, whenever there's a method, it has a receiver type, the object of that receiver type that is to the left of the dot, that is an implicit argument to the function, to the method, rather. So even though double looks like it has no argument, it really has one argument, okay, a hidden argument. You do not pass it explicitly. So when I call double, I say v.double. In parentheses, I have nothing, right? But that v is going to be passed to the double function when you actually uh, make the call. So that's passed automatically, uh, invisibly. You don't, the programmer doesn't have to see it. But it's important that you as a programmer are aware that it is actually being passed. Reason why is because it's passed call by value. So this is how passing argument passing is done in Go, it's call by value. So what happens is when that V, that object to the left of that dot, gets passed to double implicitly, it is passed by value. A copy of V is made and passed to double. So this impacts how, how what double can do. So it's important to realize if V is actually being passed. The object to the left of the dot is being passed as an argument even though it doesn't look like it in an obvious way. Thank you. Module 3, Object Orientation and Go. Topic 1.3, Support for Classes. Now, in a normal object-oriented language, uh, it's, you know, a class is defined, it's data associated with some kind of methods. And usually, you can define, uh, you can associate lots of different data. You can roll up lots of different uh, variables, maybe an int, a float, whatever type of data, you can uh, put a lot of it, as much as you want, together, and then associate that with, a, uh, with any number of methods. And you can do the same thing in Go. Uh, of course, you're gonna use a receiver type, just like we talked about, you don't have classes, you have receiver types but you can just use a type that has lots of data in it. So before we were using examples where the type was just an int, my int, right? It was just an int, one piece of data. But you can make, uh, it's very common to use a struct as the as a receiver type, a struct of some kind. So because uh, structs basically allow you to compose all kinds of different data fields, right? So in this case, my point struct, I'm just composing two, two, uh, two numbers, an x and a y both float. So two floating point numbers, they're composed into one struct. But remember with a struct, you can you can compose arbitrary an arbitrary amount of uh, information you can put together. Okay, so uh, so that's what, so it's very common to see uh, a type a, a receiver type be a struct of some kind with lots of different data, and uh, it's a traditional feature of class to be able to just roll lots of different data together. Now these structs uh, structs with methods you can take a struct and define it as a type, like we just did with that point type, and then you can associate methods with that type. And then you get what you would normally think of as a class in another language. You get this struct with lots of different data associated and with lots of different, as many methods as you want associated with the struct. So uh, we got an example of that right here. We're using the point that I defined uh, just in the last slide. So this point, I want to make a function called dist to origin. Uh, and I'm defining it right there. Notice that to the left of the name of the function, dist to origin, I pass it uh, a point, p point, right? I, when I say I pass it, it's an implicit pass, right? So it, it doesn't have any explicit arguments, but it, uh, its receiver type is a point called P, and that will be implicitly passed to dist to origin. Now then if you look at the, uh, the function, the insides of it, the internals, it's just doing Pythagorean theorem, right? It's, um, it's taking the, it's squaring the X, squaring the Y, adding together, then it returns the square root. So it just py does Pythagorean theorem, nothing sophisticated. And then in my main, I can make a point, uh, p1 is uh, 3 comma 4, and then I can just call p one dot dist to origin, and that p1 will be implicit, p1 together with its x and y coordinates will be implicitly passed to dist to origin. Dist to origin will then uh, compute, use, do Pythagorean theorem and return the distance, which is 5 in this case. Next. Module 3, or object orientation in Go. Topic 2.1, encapsulation. So Go uh, provides a lot of different support for encapsulation and keeping private data. Uh, but you want to be able to have controlled access to the data. So typically, even if you have private data in some package, you probably don't want to um, hide it completely. 
right? Or else why are you even importing it in the package, importing it anyway? You hide it, but you want to have controlled access to it. So what that means is you want people to be able to use that data, but only in the way that you define, okay? Using your methods so or functions. So what you want to do, what you can do is you can define a set of functions, public functions, that allow somebody, allow another package, an external package, to access the hidden data. So as an example, say I got my data package right there, package data, got my hidden variable x, x uh, int equals 1. Now then I can define inside that same package a function called printx. And printx just Print x, okay? It does exactly what it says. Now, print x, notice it starts with a capital letter. So that means it gets exported. So if some, if uh, my main package decides to import the data package, I will, the main package will be able to access this print x method, even though it can't directly access the x. Okay, and so it now uh, what happens is I can access the main method, the main uh, function can access the x variable only through this print x function. So if I want to see the x value, I have to call printx. Uh, so if I look in my, in my main code, I import the data, and then in my main, I can call data.printx, and then I can see the value of x. Even though I couldn't directly access x from my main, I can indirectly access it through these, um, these public functions. So this is generally how we're going to control access to data that we want to hide. You know, you want to give access, but only in a controlled fashion. We let them see what they what we want them to see. Is the idea also to modify code to modify X, right? I mean, as it is, X cannot be modified externally, right? There's no method. There's no way the main can directly see X or modify it. But if I wanted to allow the main to be able to modify X, I could make some kind of a function uh, inside the package with started with a capital letter that main could call to access the uh, the variable. So uh, we can do this with structures too. So say there's some kind of a you know we have some kind of a, a type that's a structure like our point type. We put that in our data package again, right? And maybe the x and the y at coordinates, we don't want the uh, the outside user, the person who's using this type, to be able to directly modify x and y. We want to be able to control their uh, their observation and their control their mo modifications to x and y. So we call we give them lowercase names, lowercase x, lowercase y. But uh, we define a set of functions inside that package, the data package, that allow them, that are public, and allow another package to use to actually access x and y in some way. So for instance, the first one you might want to define is initme uh, that I'm defining down here. And that, notice it is uh, associated with the, uh, with the point type. The receiver type is point, so p uh, star point. Uh, I call initme. And initme just allows me to initialize x and y, right? That's something clearly you're going to want to do. You make a point, you want to initialize the x and y values. So I do it through this initme, uh, initme method that I'm defining. And it just sets p.x equal to the first argument, p.y equal to the second argument. Uh, so, I, so in this way, using this function, this initme function, I can modify x and y. Uh, even though I can't directly touch x and y, I can do it through this function. Uh, then a few more functions that you would might want to add to uh, to allow access to the x and y they're hidden. Uh, this is scale. So scale again it is associated with a point. It's a receiver type is point, and uh, it scale you pass it a, a floating point number v, and it just scales x and y together. So it multiplies p dot x times the scale factor, p times y, p dot y times the scale factor. Again, we're not trusting the user, the programmer, to do this. We're scaling it, we're scaling both of them together. So if they want to scale, they have to call our scale function. They can scale them both. Uh, also, print me. Maybe I want to be able to print uh, the x and y values. And since the since you know another package can't directly access x and y to call print line on it, uh, we j we have to provide a function for that print me, and it just uh, goes in there and it prints out the x and y, prints out p dot x, p dot y. So now we define this set of functions, a set of methods really, because they're all associated with the type point. And these methods are all public because we started them with capital letters, print me, scale, they're all capital. So we can access them outside in, say, our main package. So in our main package, we can, we can use them. So for instance, in this main, we, uh, we declare, we, declare uh, we make a point, data.point, p, call it p. Then we call p.initme to initialize its x and y to 3 and 4. Then we call p.scale to uh, scale it, to multiply 3 and 4 times 2, so it should be 6 and 8. Then we call p.printme, it prints uh, 6 and 8. So if we ran this, it would work. And in this way, 
even though uh, even though we can't from the main, we can't directly access x and y. We can't say p dot x equals bam, p dot y equals right. But we can access them through these functions, these uh, rather methods that are provided to us in a controlled way. Thank you. Module three: Object Orientation and Go. Topic two point two: Pointer Receivers. So we've been talking about methods, defining methods for uh, and associating them with types, uh, with different receiver types. So there are a few limitations of this uh, process that we may need to overcome. So remember <clears throat> that this receiver type is implicitly passed, the receiver object is implicitly passed as an argument to the method. So even though it's not explicitly passed, it is implicitly passed. And remember that argument passing in Go is copy by is passed by uh, passed by value, copy called by value. So that means that um, that you can't the method can't modify the data inside the receiver object. So as an example, let's say we had some method called offset x, and it should increase the x coordinate of a point. Right? We want to add some constant to the x coordinate of some point. So in our function main, we say p equals uh, p colon equals point three comma four. We make a point. Now we say p dot offset x, and we pass it five as the the value that we want to add to the x. That won't change the x. It can't change the x coordinate. The reason why is because this offset x is being passed a copy of p one, not a pointer to p one, a copy of p one. And since it gets a copy of p one, it can change its copy. So it gets its own p one dot x copy. It can change that from three to eight, but that goes away as soon as the uh, as soon as the main is as soon as this, uh, the function is done executing. As soon as offset x is done executing, that goes away because it's in its environment. It's gone. So what we want to do is to be able to change the well, what we want in this case is to be able to change the actual values inside p one. But you can't because methods uh, they get the 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 p one the p one the object is actually passed by value. Uh, another problem with that is if the receiver is large. A lot of copying happens when you make a call. So when you call by value and the object gets the receiver object is passed as an argument, the whole thing has to get pushed on, uh, get copied onto the stack internally. And if it's a large receiver object, then that's a lot of copying. So in this case, I got my type image, <clears throat> and this type is a hundred by hundred array of ints, which is actually small for an image. Okay, uh, so that's like ten thousand ints. So when I call uh, this blur image, <clears throat> which is some, some method that's associated with uh, whose receiver type is this image. When I call blur image, the I1, this image, actually gets, has to get passed to the blur image, uh, to the blur image method. And that's 10,000 ints that you've got to copy onto the stack. And that can take a long time. And images actually are sort of a worst case because they can get gigantic, right? 100 by 100 is not even big. So that can waste a lot of time. So this is a problem. So what do you do? Well, we do what we did before with uh, with with method argument with not even with method with regular functions. We can just pass instead of passing calling by value, you can call by reference. So you explicitly pass the uh, pointer to the object rather than the object itself. So the way you would you manage this is when you just declare the function, like we're seeing here, we're declaring this offset x. See its receiver type to the left of the name of the function. So in parentheses it says p star point. I say star point this time, asterisk point, right? Instead, if I said p point, then I'm passing the point ca call by value. But if I say p star point, then now p is a pointer to a point, right? So now I'm and when I implicitly pass this uh, this this p value to offset x, it's going to pass a pointer to the uh, to the uh, point object that we're, to the point type that we're talking about. So now, uh, now inside the function, I say p dot x equals p dot x plus v, and that'll actually work because p dot x is now since p is actually a pointer to this uh, to this structure, p dot x actually refers it points to the actual um, x value in memory. So you can actually modify it now because you're doing call by reference. Thank you. Module three: Object Orientation and Go. Topic two point three: Pointer Receivers, Referencing and Dereferencing. So one thing about using a pointer uh, receiver is that there's no need to dereference the the pointer inside the, the the method. So what I mean by this is that uh, okay, so let's take a look at this uh, this example offset x. I want to I want it to have a pointer receiver because I want offset x to actually be able to modify the x coordinate of the type. So I have to pass it a pointer. 
to uh, to p. So now, if you look to the left of the uh, the function name offset x, you see p star point, right? So the receiver is a pointer type. Now notice inside the function, I say uh, p dot x equals p dot x plus v. I don't say star p dot x equals star p dot x plus v, right? That's a dereferencing that you would normally use with pointers. I don't have to do that because this is a common enough thing that Golang just uh, allows you to get it, basically the compiler recognizes it. It says, okay, I know what you mean, right? But you can just say p dot x, and it knows, even though it's a pointer, it knows to get the x field, it knows to basically dereference it automatically. So it's just a handy shorthand. You don't have to do the, do the dereferencing uh, when you're doing this. And uh, likewise, there's no need to reference either. So, uh, so say I'm in my main, <clears throat> and I want to I've defined my offset x as I showed you, where it accepts a pointer to uh, the re sorry the uh, receiver type is a pointer, right? Now in this case in this main, I'm declaring this p this point p. I'm making it uh, it's point three comma four. So p is actually a, uh, a a struct, right? It is it is the type? It is the actual struct? It is not a pointer to the struct. It is the struct. But then when I call offset x, I say p dot offset x. When really uh, since offset x is supposed to have a pointer receiver, you would think you would have to say ampersand p dot offset x, but you don't. You can just say p dot offset x, and go. The Go compiler recognizes that just because this is a common thing to do, so it just makes it easier. It's a convenience. So when using pointer receivers, it is good programming practice practice to either have all methods use pointer receivers or have none of them use pointer receivers. Okay? It's just a good standard. It's easy to get confused. So if you have some methods use pointer receivers and some not use pointer receivers, it can get confusing. You know, you'll send a pointer to the, to the one that doesn't need a pointer and so on. So it's just uh, more, it's more appropriate to use. It's a good practice. You don't have to. You can mix and match if you want, but it's good practice to use all pointer references for a particular type or, or all non-pointer references. Module 4, Interfaces for Abstraction. Topic 1.1, Polymorphism. Polymorphism is a property very commonly associated with object-oriented programming. Uh, it's the ability to, for an object to have different forms depending on the context. Okay, so what does that mean, different forms? Uh, that can mean a lot of things, but what it typically means is that you can have a function or method with one name, you know, area, and it does one thing for one object and another thing for another type of object. Okay, so in one class, so for instance, take area. Okay, if you want to compute the area of a rectangle, that's base times height. You want to compute the area of a triangle is one half base times height. So the same uh, function name is going to do two different things depending on the context. If you're doing it with respect to a rectangle or with respect to a triangle, so. Uh, that's what polymorphism is. So you'd say, oh, po area is polymorph it's polymorphic because it can do two different things depending on the context. So, uh, and another way to think about it is that these two area implementations, they are at a high level of abstraction, they are identical. What they do is they compute the area, right? No matter what the object is, if it's a rectangle or if it's a triangle, the area is what's computed. So at a high level, forgetting the detail, they do the same thing. At the low level, and how they actually compute uh, the the area, they are different, right? So there's so really polymorphism is a way of establishing an abstraction. These things are the same at the high level of abstraction, but underneath they're different, right? Uh, so that's what we want to allow. It's very it's useful for a lot of reasons. So we need um, we need Golang to have some type of support for uh, for polymorphism. So what I'll first describe is how polymorphism is usually implemented in traditional object-oriented languages. So one thing that, uh, that is usually used in object-oriented languages to support polymorphism is inheritance. And Golang does not have inheritance. So I'll just say that again. Golang does not have inheritance. Inheritance is where you get a, a series of classes, and they have this class, subclass, superclass relationship, or sometimes you call it parent and child class, parent class, child class. So the sub superclass is the top level class, and the subclass is extends from the superclass. And the subclass inherits the methods and data of the superclass. So as an example, maybe I've got a speaker superclass. And a speaker is supposed to represent uh, everything that can speak. 
right? With anything that can make noises, okay? You call that a speaker. Now, underneath speaker, uh, a subclass of that might be cat and might be dog, right? Because cats can speak, they can make noise. Dogs can make noise. So maybe I've got this subclass cat, subclass dog, both subclass of this superclass speaker. And cat and dog will both inherit the properties of the superclass. So my superclass speaker, let's say it has a method called speak. And that just prints out some, you know, whatever noise the creature makes. So uh, speaker, since it's generic, it, it speak, it, the superclass, it speak method will just print out, you know, noise, arbitrary noise, because it's generic. But then the subclass is cat and dog. They'll also have a speak method. They'll inherit it from the speaker superclass. So they, they get the same, the properties, they extend down. Uh, so cat and dog are different forms of speaker, and this is where the polymorphism, they're different forms of each other. This is where polymorphism concepts come, uh, come into play. And remember, the Go doesn't have inheritance. Okay? Now, inheritance is one thing that you use in a regular object-oriented language to support polymorphism. But you also, on top of that, you're going to need uh, n another property, uh, overriding, the ability to override a method. So uh, a method is override, overridden. A subclass overrides a method when it redefines a method that it inherits from the superclass. So in the example we're talking about here, you got this superclass speaker, and under that you got this subclass cat, subclass dog. And speaker has this speak method, and uh, cat and dog inherit the speak method too. But uh, without overriding the speak method, the cat speak method and the dog speak method do exactly what the superclass, what the speaker speak method does. They just print out noise, right, which is arbitrary. So what you want is for the cat speak method to print out meow and the dog speak method to print out woof, right? So what happens is uh, that's called overriding where the cat, the cat class, the cat subclass will redefine the speak method to print out what it wants, meow, right? And then the dog subclass will redefine it to print out what it wants, woof. So now the speaker class the speaker superclass, it has its speak method, and cat also has a speak method. Dog also has a speak method, but the cat speak and the dog speak to do two different things. Okay, So cat and dog classes have overridden the definition of the speak method with their own new definition of the speak method. So now you can say speak is polymorphic because speak can, it has two different implementations for each class. So speak in the, in the context of a cat, it'll print meow. Context of a dog, it'll uh, print woof. But the idea is to support polymorphism, what you normally see in an object-oriented language, you see uh, inheritance, and then you also see o the ability to override a method. So, they, so both the subclasses inherit the uh, speak method, but then they can override it and define it the way they want. So uh, and one thing to note is that the, uh, they, uh, they actually have used the same, even though they're overriding the method, they use the same uh, signature. So these function signatures, the method signature is the same. So this method speak, it has the same name in both cat and dog class, has the same arguments, and same return types. Uh, so the signature will stay the same, and you'd call it polymorphic in that case. Thank you. Module 4, Interfaces for Abstraction. Topic 1.2, Interfaces. An interface is a, a concept used in Go, and it helps us get polymorphism. So we don't get uh, you know, inheritance. We don't need inheritance. We don't need overriding. We can use interfaces to basically accomplish uh, the same thing. And you know, I think it's in a better way. I think it's cleaner. But you know, this, is up to, this is up for argument, right? Because people who are used to Java or something like that will like it the, uh, the other way. They'll like their inheritance and you know, want to fight to keep it. But Go does this in a different way. So an interface is basically a set of method, method signatures. So by signatures, I mean the name of the method, the parameters of the method and their types, and the return values and their types. So uh, that's all it is. It's n there's no implementations, uh, uh, implementation of a method, right? So it just defines the signatures for the method. So it says the methods have to have this name, these parameters, these return values. That's an interface. So it's not, uh, it's not a type or anything. It's, it's less than that. It's used to express conceptual similarity between types. So what I mean by that is, say you got this, um, say I got an interface called uh, shape 2D, right? And that's my interface, and it's supposed to represent two-dimensional shapes. So I, all two-dimensional shapes, I'm gonna say, they have to have two methods, okay? An area method and a perimeter method, right? If it's a two-dimensional shape, you gotta be able to compute the area, you gotta be able to compute the perimeter, then I call it a two-dimensional shape. 
So my two-dimensional shape interface just says, look, you gotta have these two methods with the arguments that I say, in this case, no arguments, right? You gotta have these two methods uh, in order to be considered a two-dimensional shape. But if you have those two methods, any type that has those two methods, it, it can be considered a two-dimensional shape. That's what an interface is saying. So it's saying that they are conceptually similar. You know, a circle, a square, a rectangle, a triangle. You can compute the area of all those and the perimeter of all those, so I'm gonna call them all two-dimensional shapes. So satisfying interface, a type satisfies an interface if it actually defines all the methods specified in the interface. So remember that um, a method in an interface, an interface doesn't specify, doesn't design, give you the method. It just gives you the signature for the method. It doesn't implement the method. So if a type actually implements all the methods in the interface with the same method signatures, so same arguments, same name, same return values, then that type is said to satisfy the interface. So for instance, I can have a, uh, a shape 2D interface, and I might have a two, uh, two types, a uh, rectangle type, triangle type. And if the rectangle type and the triangle type both define an area and a perimeter method with uh, the, the appropriate arguments and return values, then you will say rectangle and triangle both satisfy the shape 2D interface. And so they, are, they can be considered to be two-dimensional shapes. Now, right, rectangle and triangle can have lots of other methods uh, besides, the, uh, besides the area and perimeter. Right? Any number of other methods. Also, rectangle and triangle can have lots of other data. Maybe they're structs and uh, struct types and they have X, Y, Z points. Who knows what they have, right? None of that matters. As long as they have the area and perimeter that are specified in the, uh, in the interface, then that's enough and they can be considered uh, to, be, to be satisfying the interface and considered to be shape uh, two-dimensional shapes. So what that accomplishes is it basically accomplishes what you get from inheritance and overriding together, right? So now I've got rectangle and triangle. They're, if they're both shaped 2D, if they've satisfied that interface, then they both have area, they both have perimeter, but their area and perimeter methods can do completely different things, right? Because when you compute the area of a rectangle, it is different than computing the area of a triangle, right? So their area, their implementations can be different, but they have the same name, and at the high level, they perform the same thing, they compute area. So in this way, we're using an interface to accomplish in Golang what you would use inheritance and overriding to accomplish typically in a thing like Java or some other object-oriented language. So how do you define an interface type? It's pretty straightforward. It looks sort of like a struct. Uh, there we got uh, shape 2D. So I say type, shape 2D, interface. Just use that keyword interface after the name of the uh, interface. In curly brackets, I start listing the uh, signatures of the methods. So in this case, there's only two methods and two signatures that I need, area and perimeter. They, both of them, area and perimeter, take no arguments and they return a float, a 64 float. Uh, so that's it, that's how you define this interface. Uh, I just list all these method signatures that I wanna put in the interface. Now then, uh, say later on, you know, in my code, I define a type triangle and I don't even say what's in it. I just uh, have an open curly bracket, closed curly bracket with some dots just to say, it doesn't matter what data I'm putting inside that triangle, right? Maybe that data triangle, maybe it's a struct or something like that, who knows what it is. It doesn't matter. Uh, but whatever it is, as long as I define a uh, function area whose receiver type is a triangle, and a function perimeter whose receiver type is also a triangle, and the area and perimeter also take no arguments and uh, return float 64s just like the interface, then this type triangle is said to satisfy that shape ID interface. Shape 2D interface, rather. So uh, and it doesn't matter what other data is in triangle, what other methods are using triangle as a receiver type. As long as it's got area and perimeter and it matches, then it satisfies the interface. Oh, and one, one other thing before I go on is that you don't have to state it explicitly. So uh, in other languages that have interfaces, you often have to say you know, uh, explicitly the triangle satisfies the, this interface, the shape 2D interface. You don't say that in Go. You just say, here's the interface, and here's my type triangle, and here are the methods for triangle. And the compiler figure, it, it can do the matching automatically. It says, oh, I see you have an area and perimeter. I will treat you just like I treat anything that satisfies the Shape 2D interface. Thank you. Module 4, Interfaces for Abstraction. Topic 1.3, Interface versus Concrete Types. So uh, concrete types and interface types are fundamentally different, fundamentally different. Uh, a concrete type is a regular type. Uh, it specifies the exact representation of the data and the methods. 
uh, data specifically, but also methods that are that are using the type as a receiver type. So it, they're fully specified. And it has complete implementations of the method of the, all the methods. So any methods that use this type as a receiver type, they're completely specified. But um, the the uh, the first thing is the is sort of a big difference between interface types and concrete types is that the exact representation of data and the data is in there. So if you have a, a concrete type, it's got to have a, it's going to have a bunch of data, one or more pieces of data that are associated with the type. Now an interface type just specifies some method signatures. So uh, no data. Is specified. It just uh, just the methods, and even the methods, their implementations are abstracted. You don't have implementations. You just have the signatures of the methods. So that's the difference between the two. But remember that when you give uh, an interface, interface eventually gets mapped to a concrete type, and we'll see that in a second. So an interface value. Uh, when you create an interface, you haven't declare an interface type. You make a value of that type. You can treat it like other values, right? Ants, floats, and all this. You can make a variable of that type. So I can make a variable of uh, the type of a particular interface, like my uh, my shape 2D. I can make a variable of that of that type. Now, uh, interface values, the value of an interface like that, has two components. First, there's the uh, dynamic type. Second, there's the dynamic value. So dynamic type is the concrete type is the, uh, the concrete type that it's assigned to. So the, um, the, the dynamic value, though, is actually the, um, it's actually the, the dynamic type. It's the value of that dynamic type. So the dynamic type is just the type which is associated to. So to be more specific, let's say we're talking about shape 2D. That's my interface, right? This interface, there are several concrete types which satisfy my interface, like rectangle. That satisfies my interface. Triangle satisfies my interface. Now, when I make my actual uh, my my uh, interface variable, right, and I give it a value, that value has got to be mapped to a, a concrete type. Maybe it's mapped to a, a rectangle or a triangle or something like that. And that rectangle, or triangle, whatever it is, it's going to have a value. So the rectangle might have some points in it, and the triangle might have some points in it. So there's a dynamic type, which is a type of the concrete type, concrete type that the interface is assigned, the interface value is assigned to. And the dynamic value is the value of that dynamic type. So an interface value is actually a pair, the dyna dynamic type together with the dynamic value. Uh, this probably will become more clear uh, with the next slides when I give it a bit of an example. So defining an interface type. So we got this type um, speaker interface, right? It's a speaker interface. And all we define in there is this speak method, which takes no arguments, returns no values. So very simple interface. So that's our interface type at the, up at the top. Now then, I uh, also define my dog type. Okay, it's a type called dog. It's a structure, and uh, it's got just a string in there. Okay, the name of the dog, let's say, right? Name. It's called name. So it's just got. That's my whole whole uh, dog type. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this dog type uh, make it satisfy my speaker interface. So I declare a function called speak. Its receiver type is dog. And it just prints uh, the name of the dog, you know, d dot name, right? So that's what the dog speaks. So, so now, uh, dog is a type that satisfies this uh, speaker, uh, the speaker interface. Now, in my main, I first thing I do is I declare uh, a speaker. So an s one, s one is a variable, and it is going to actually be have a speaker value. So it's a speaker type. It's going to be a speaker value, right? So it's a s one is an interface value. Next, I declare a, a dog, a D1. It's going to be my dog type, but it's going, to, it's going to have a name equal to Brian. Now, then I can say S1 equals D1. Now, that is legal because the dog type satisfies the S1 interface. So S1 can be a dog, right? So there's, because it satisfies the interface. So I can say S1 is equal to D1. So now S1, it, which is a speaker, S1 is a speaker type. It is now its concrete type that is assigned to is D1. That is the concrete. Uh, that is the concrete object that it's assigned to, which is the concrete type is going to be uh, the the dynamic type is going to be the dog type, and the value is going to be the dog value, which you know its name is Brian. And then I can say S1 dot speak, and it'll call the speak of the dog, right? Uh, which will just print out Brian. So the dynamic type in this case of S1 is dog, is the dog type. And the dynamic value is D1, which contains that name Brian. Okay. So the, the, this S1, which is a speaker object, it is, oh, sorry, it's a speaker object, which is an interface. It is a pair, the dynamic type, dog, that's the type, and dynamic value, dynamic value, which is uh, D1 in this case, which has this dog name, name Brian. That's all it has in it.
Okay, so an interface, like I just to repeat, has dynamic type and dynamic uh, value. Now, an interface can have a nil dynamic value, meaning no dynamic value. It can have a type, a dynamic type, but not a dynamic value. So let me give you an example of that. Uh, <clears throat> we got a variable S1, it's a speaker, okay? Then I have my dog uh, D1, and I make it a pointer to a dog, star dog. Then I say S1 equals D1. Now, when I do that, uh, I'm assigning S1 to D1, but D1, it's not a concrete uh, uh, object. Its type is dog, or star dog. It's pointed to a dog. But it doesn't have any data in it, okay? So remember, dog has this uh, data, this name, which is a string. But D1 is a, a pointer to a dog. So it's not an actual dog. It doesn't have the data in it, okay? So D1 has no concrete value as a, at this point. But it has a type, okay? It's associated with a dog. It's appointed to a dog. So what that means is S1, S1, when I do that assignment, S1 equals D1, S1 has a dynamic type, dog, or dog pointer, but it has no dynamic value because D1 doesn't have a dynamic value yet, right? Because D1 is a pointer to a dog. It doesn't actually have dog information in it, namely the name, okay? So this is a situation where you've got an interface that has a nil dynamic value. Nil means nothing. It's sort of the empty and go. So it has a nil dynamic value, but it has a dynamic type. And this is legal, you know, to have a, dy uh, a, d a dynamic type, but no dynamic value is legal. So when you have that situation, we have an interface like that with a dynamic type, but no dynamic value, you can still call the methods of S1. So in this case, S1, its method is speak, right? That's the uh, method that's defined in the interface. And dog, or at least it's uh, specified in the interface, and then dog defines that method, right? So when I say dog defines that method, there's a method dog whose receiver type is dog, uh, method speak whose receiver type is dog. And that method is fully specified. Now, when the, this, um, <clears throat> this S1, it has a dynamic type. The fact that it has a dynamic type means that the compiler knows that when you call speak, call that speak method on uh, S1, it can look at the type and say, oh, the type is dog, dynamic type is dog. So I know that the method implementation that I want is dog method implementation. So you can, it can call that function, that method speak, even without having a dynamic value. All it needs to know is the dynamic type. The dynamic type is enough information to go find which implementation of speak you want to use. Now, it would be wise inside your, uh, inside your function uh, inside the the function, the speak function, to check to see if uh, if the 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 variable has a if the if it has a dynamic value or not. But the point though is that you can make the call even without a dynamic value. All you need is a dynamic type. So if we take a look at over here. We got this function uh, dog, uh, speak rather, and it's uh, it's its receiver is dog. And notice inside the function it says if d equals nil. Then it prints noise, some generic thing. Else it prints uh, d.name, prints the dog's name. You know. Now, what that does is it checks, saying d equals nil, it checks, look, it, does this have a dynamic value or not? If it doesn't have a dynamic value, d equals nil, then it just does what, what it says there. It prints noise because it doesn't have a dynamic value yet. It prints something generic. Else, if it does have a value, then it knows it can actually access d.name, d .name, and so it prints out the name. And then the rest of the code, maybe that would appear inside a, a main or something like that, which I'm not drawing here. But uh, So I declare the speaker S1. I declare the, uh, the dog pointer D1. I set S1 to D1. So now S1 has a dynamic type but no dynamic value. And then I can call S1.speak, and it works. Right? I can call S1.speak even without the dynamic value uh, the, because I can call because it can figure out the compiler can figure out oh I see S1 is mapped to d to D1 which is a dog so I can find the dog uh, the the method of speak that is associated with dog that I have defined up above so this is actually legal so the point of all this is it's legal to have a speaker uh, sorry an interface with a a dynamic type but no dynamic value and in that situation. You can still call the methods of that of that interface. Uh, you, so it's it's legal to do that. Now it would be wise, like we do here, to check inside the method if the uh, if the dynamic value is nil or not, right? Because you might want to do something like, for instance, if we didn't do this check, this is where we say if d equals nil. If we didn't do that check, we might try to print d dot name even though d was nil, and that would throw an error, right, at runtime. 
So uh, we don't want to, it's probably wise to check it, but it's allowed, this is a legal state, to have a dynamic type but no dynamic value. Now, on the other hand, uh, you, people use the term a nil interface value. This describes an interface with a nil dynamic type. So it, it doesn't have a, it, not only does it not have a dynamic value, it doesn't have a dynamic type. And that's a different situation. <clears throat> In that situation, when you don't even have the dynamic type, then you cannot call the methods on that interface. Because it, without the dynamic type, you can't know which method you are referring to. So for instance, uh, here, if the, the, at the top example, I, I got this speaker uh, S1, dog D1, and I say S1 equals D1. So it has a dynamic type, but no dynamic value. So the compiler can figure out, if I were to call speak, uh, it would be able to figure out, oh, I see it's the dog's speak, right? The one that's, whose receiver type is dog. But if I have a nil dynamic type, so if I just say var S1 speaker, right, and leave it at that, then I don't have a dynamic type yet because I haven't assigned S1 to anything, right? So S1 is just sitting there with no dynamic type, no, dy no dynamic value. And with, in that state, there's no actual method to call. If you tried to call speak on that, it would throw an error because there's no method implementation. Remember, remember, an interface doesn't specify the method. It doesn't give the implementation of the method. It specifies just the name and the arguments and the return value, but it doesn't actually define the method. So if you just say var S1 speaker, there's no method that it's associated with. There's no speak method associated with S1, so this would throw an error. So the point here is summarize that if you have a dy no dynamic type and no dynamic value, on an interface, then you can't call the methods of the interface. Thank you. Module 4, Interfaces for Abstraction, Topic 2.1, Using Interfaces. Uh, so interfaces, we've talked about them, and one thing we want to talk about now is a little bit of uh, how to use them. So what are they used for uh, language-wise? In language, why would you need an interface? You know, And I already said interfaces, they express some sort of a conceptual similarity between different types. So if you, the idea is that if, you, if two types satisfy an interface, then they must be similar in some way that is important to the application. So one common sort of practical thing that you would use an interface for is when you need a function, you want to write a function which takes multiple types as a parameter. So specifically, normally uh, a function, it takes, say it takes an integer as its argument, right? It can only take an integer. But what if you want to take an integer or a float? something like this, maybe an uh, integer or a float or a string, right? It wanted to take multiple types. And different types, it'll do different things, but you want it to be able to take different types. You can use an interface for that. So uh, I'll give you an example. Say I've got uh, a function foo, and it's got to take a parameter. And this parameter, it can be either type x or type y. And I'm talking very generically now. I'll give you a concrete example in the next slide. But So I got this foo. It's going to take a parameter, which is type x or type y. I want to take either type. So the way I can do that is I can define an interface called Z. And X's parameter can be that inter the type it can be an interface type Z. Then I define X and Y to satisfy Z. Right? So X and Y are both satisfying the interface Z. Then foo can since it can take anything that satisfies the interface Z, it can take X and Y as its arguments. So uh, this is this is a, a common way to use an interface, and uh, to basically an interface in this in this way it sort of generalizes, right? It says it hides the details of the differences between the types. It's like, look, you, these two types are similar in the way that's important to me, and so your function can just take the interface. It means it takes anything that is similar in that way. So to be a little bit more specific. I made up a problem about a pool in a yard, right? So I have a backyard, and I want to put a pool in my yard. But the pool, before I can put the pool in the yard, it needs to fit in my yard, and it needs to be fenced because, you know, I don't want my kids to fall into the pool, so I need fencing around the pool, and it needs to fit in the yard. So to fit in the yard, the total area of this pool needs to be limited, less than the area of my backyard. Also, to fence it, uh, I only have so much fence because fence costs money. I only have a limited amount of fence. So the, 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 the perimeter of this, this thing has to be limited, too to within some limit, you know, depending on how much I can afford. So I need to determine if a particular pool shape satisfies this criteria, because I'm trying to go through a, a bunch of different pool shapes, and I want to pick one that satisfies these criteria that's sort of small enough that it can fit in the yard, and also the perimeter is small enough that I can afford to fence it. So I'm going to write this function called fit in yard. 
and this is going to return a Boolean. So it takes a shape as an argument, some shape, like a, maybe I got some triangular shape. I pass that to fit in yard, and it returns true if the shape satisfies the criteria. criteria. So if the area is small enough and the perimeter is small enough, then it says true. If I pass it a shape like rectangle and it's a big rectangle and you know it doesn't fit in my yard, then it'll return false. Okay? So that's what fit in yard is. Now the thing about fit in yard is it's got to take a shape as an argument. But I want it to take any shape as an argument. I don't care if it's a triangle, circle, square, rectangle, whatever. It could be any shape. I should take it as an argument. But I have to be able to compute the area and compute the perimeter. Okay? So it not any shape, it's gotta be a shape whose area and perimeter I can compute. So uh, my fit in yard, so that's the idea. It should take rectangles, triangles, whatever. But, uh, but it, a valid shape has to have an area method and a perimeter method, right? So if the shape, if I can't compute the area, then I'm not, I won't be able to tell if, it's a, uh, you know, if it fits in my yard. Say it's a sphere or something, right? There's no area. It's a 3D shape. That's a 3D object. I can't compute area of a thing like that, right? So that is not a valid shape that I want to try to fit in my yard. Uh, so any shape that has area and, and, uh, per and perimeter, that's okay with me. So what I can do is I can define this interface for shapes uh, that, that have the area and perimeter. So I make my shape 2D interface. We already talked about this, but I make my shape 2D interface. It uh, specifies area and perimeter, which return floats, 64. Then I can make uh, my, my types, triangle type, rectangle type, what type, whatever types I want. And as long as these types, I don't care how they're defined, what data is inside them, as long as they have methods that use them as receiver types, that uh, it has area method and perimeter method. So triangle, uh, you got area that has triangle as a perimeter, as a, as a receiver method, and also perimeter. Same thing for rectangle. It's got an area and a perimeter. As long as they have area and perimeter, I should be able to take this as an argument. So they satisfy this, uh, this, this interface uh, shape 2D. So in my fit and yard implementation, I, uh, you can see that the argument that it takes is called S, and its type is the interface type, uh, shape 2D. So what that means is that its argument can be any type that satisfies that shape 2D interface, like rectangle, triangle, whatever the types are. And it returns a Boolean. And all the function does is very simple. just says if S.area is less than 100, say 100 is the size of my, my, my backyard, right? And s.perimeter is less than 100 because that's all the fence I can afford. Then return true, else return false. So, uh, and any valid argument, a valid argument to this is any, uh, anything that, uh, any type that satisfies the shape 2D interface. Now, the empty interface is a standard interface, it's predefined, and it just specifies no methods. So what that means is that there, any type, any type can actually satisfy that interface. And what you use it for is when you want to have a function, a function argument be any type. You don't want to restrict it at all in terms of the type that this function can accept. Then you just uh, give its type, make its type the empty interface. So as an example, we got this function print me, and its val argument is called is is the empty interface. Uh, that's how you specify the empty interface that I haven't read. So that means that val can just be any type. And all this does is just print it. So it will print any type you give it. You give it an int, float, string, whatever. It'll just print that to the screen. Thank you. Module 4, Interfaces for Abstraction, Topic 2.2, Type Assertions. So a lot of the point of an interface is to conceal differences between types. So if you think about it, an interface can hide the differences between two different types. It, it basically highlights the similarities. So uh, like in this fit and yard implementation, uh, there's, there are rectangles and there are triangles, but from the inside fit and yard, they're all treated the same, right? Uh, as long as they both satisfy shape 2D, I can call s.area, s.perimeter, right? So uh, what you're doing is, uh, what interfaces allow you to do is to treat different types that have some similarity, some similar methods, treat them the same, right? So you're hiding differences by using uh, interfaces. But sometimes you need to disambiguate. Sometimes you need to treat different types in different ways. Okay, so sometimes, like see in this function, we don't, right? We can just say s.area, s.perimeter. You treat them exactly the same because they have the same methods. But sometimes you do need to differentiate uh, based on the type. You need to be able to figure out what is the concrete type, right? So in this example, uh, s, since you're just calling area and perimeter, it doesn't matter exactly what the concrete type is. 
right? The concrete type could be rectangle, it could be triangle, doesn't matter. Either way, area and perimeter do what you think. So in this case, the concrete type that underlies the interface, uh, interface value, that doesn't matter, okay? But there are definitely cases where the concrete type matters. In those cases, you're gonna have to expose those type differences. So you're gonna have to take this this interface, which is hiding the differences between the types, and, and, and peel it apart again and say, okay, actually, this is really a rectangle, this is really a triangle. So a situation like that might be a graphics program, okay? So I got my graphics program, which I've used many times, but I, in my graphics program, this time I wanna write a method called, uh, write a function called draw shape, and it should draw any shape. So I wanna be able to pass it as an argument any two-dimensional shape. So I declare it uh, sort of the top line I'm showing right there. Funk draw shape. It takes a shape 2D. That's the type of its argument, shape 2D. So it can take any two-dimensional shape as an argument. So that's good, right? I've used my interface to generalize and to hide the difference, differences between the types. Rectangle, triangle, circle, doesn't matter. For passing it as an argument to draw shape anyway. Now, inside draw shape, though, in this case, I'm going to have to disambiguate. I'm going to have to determine this S. Is it a rectangle? Is it a triangle? What is it? Because maybe in the underlying API, uh, there's some kind of drawing functions that I'm using in this API, right? And the underlying drawing functions, they actually are specific to the type of, of the shape being drawn. So for instance, maybe the underlying API gives me a draw rectangle, draw rect, right? And then another draw triangle, and a draw circle, and so on, which is not uncommon in these drawing APIs, right? So you got draw rectangle, draw tri triangle, draw circle, all those. Now these API functions, my draw shape is going to have to call these, right? When it wants to draw a rectangle, it's going to have to call draw rectangle or draw triangle to draw triangle. And these underlying API functions, they take, they don't take just any shape. They don't take shape 2D. Draw rect only takes rectangles. Draw triangle only takes triangles and so on. So this is a case where I want to use my interface uh, so that I can, so my draw shape can take any argument, uh, any type of reasonable shape. But inside my draw shape, I'm going to have to differentiate. I'm going to say, look, if you're a rectangle, call draw rect. If you're a triangle, call draw triangle and so on. So in this case, Inside draw shape, I'm going to have to determine the concrete type that uh, S is based on, that the shape is based on. So for that, I use what's called a type, a type assertion. So type assertions can be used to disambiguate between uh, the different concrete types that actually uh, satisfy a particular interface. And you can see that here with draw shape, it needs to actually disambiguate. So, it's not, uh, so if it's a rectangle that's being passed, it needs to call draw rect. If it's a triangle, it needs to call draw triangle. So you can see us doing that here. At the top, uh, you got that first uh, type assertion uh, where you say it says rect comma OK colon equals. So that will return uh, a rectangle if it's a rec if the S is actually a rectangle. So if OK is true and it found a rectangle, it will call draw rect with that rectangle. Uh, otherwise, it, sec it uh, does the, the next type assertion actually checks to see if the type of, uh, of the interface of S is a triangle. So it says try OK, try comma OK, colon equal S dot triangle this time. And so that will return uh, OK will be true if S is actually a triangle. And in that case, TRI, try is going to equal that triangle. And so uh, you call tri draw triangle with, uh, with the triangle. So either way, we use this type of section to disambiguate to determine the actual underlying concrete type uh, for, for this, um, for this shape, shape 2D interface. Now, another way to do this, uh, sort of a common, common thing that you need to do is what we just did in the last slide. We went down a list of possible uh, types, so rectangle and triangle in this case. But note that, uh, you know, a, a, an interface can actually can be satisfied by many different types. So say that an interface is satisfied by 10 different types, you might need to disambiguate all 10, sort of run down the list. If you're this type, then do this. If it's that type, then do that, and so on. And so there's a switch construct, a type switch, which is just for that purpose. So you got one case for every different type that you need to, uh, to deal with. So in this case, you got two cases, case rectangle, case triangle. And uh, in each case, you know, case rectangle draws, the, uh, draws a rectangle, case triangle draws a triangle. But uh, right before that, you start with the switch. So we have a, uh, you notice the, the type, type assertion says S dot type. In parentheses, you just say type, the generic word type. And so what happens is SH will be, uh, be whatever the, ob it'll be uh, the concrete type that S represents. So if S is, 
S is like a, is actually a rectangle, then SH will be that rectangle, right? If S is a triangle, then SH will be that triangle, and you'll hit the appropriate case. So if SH is a rectangle, then you'll execute the case rectangle. If SH is a, uh, a triangle, then you'll execute the case triangle. So this is just a more convenient way to sort of run down a list of, to disambiguate a whole set of types that, uh, that all satisfy a particular interface. Thank you. Module 4, Interfaces for Abstraction, Topic 2.3, Error Handling. So I just want to show a uh, common use of interfaces in Go, uh, the error interface. So there are a lot of different um, Go functions that are built into packages which return errors. And when I say return errors, what they do is they return whatever they're supposed to return, and then their second return value is an error, right? An error uh, interface. Okay, so and we see that we see it defined over here. The error interface just uh, you know it's any type that satisfies this interface, and error interface just specifies that you have to have a method called error, which uh, prints the error message essentially, which prints something, some text that's useful. So if the under correct operation. The, uh, the error returned might be nil, right? So for instance, let's say I want to open a file, right? Uh, if it opens the file correctly, it'll return nil for the error, and there's no problem. But if the error actually has a value, then, uh, then you'll probably print the error, and it'll call its error method, and, uh, and which will successfully print the error. So show an example of that. Uh, so basically the idea is when you, uh, this happens, there are a lot of different Go language functions like this which return error as the second argument, okay? And so when that happens, you should check that error after the call and handle it if you need to. So uh, you can see in the top line, uh, we, we're opening a file. So os.open opens a file by that name. And it returns two things. One is the file, f, and the second thing is an error, yeah, if an error exists. So then right after that, for safety's sake, you should check the error. So if error not equal to nil, so if it's, if it's equal to nil, you're fine, you go on. If it's not equal to nil, then uh, do a print. That's sort of the most obvious thing to do to handle the error is just to print it. So you'd print line error and return. Uh, so printing the error, the format package, the FN, FMT package, which uh, print line is a part of, that package will call the error, fun the error method of the error to uh, generate the string and then print that string. And so this is sort of the generic way of uh, handling errors in Go. It's a very common way to, to handle errors in Go. Thank you.